Thank you all for a very prompt start to today's uh, ACM virtual workshop. A special welcome to my colleagues from Belize and St. Kitts and Nevis as we commence this ACM virtual workshop. I'd like to take this opportunity to also welcome our esteemed presenters who are not only here to speak on specific issues, but to share their knowledge about the media industry. Journalists and the law will be done by Justice Kathy Ann Waterman Lachu, founding member of ACM, former president and current executive member Wesley Gibbons, will examine journalism or verification. Mr. Dennis Chabral, former ACM vice president and former GPA president and current ACM executive will look at ethics in journalism, while president of the Media Institute of the Caribbean, Kiran Maharaj, will present on the future of Caribbean media. This virtual workshop comes at a very critical time as we, the media, battle misinformation and disinformation in a pandemic. We are also navigating our own viability and we are also seeking to recommit to the ethics associated with this profession. The challenges are many for my colleagues around the region, and these challenges are detailed in our State of the Caribbean Media Report, which was launched in early May. These range from access to information, access to key decision makers, and a need for training, among others. We are pleased to be associated with this training done at the request of Deidre Haylock, as she recognized the need for such training. This morning, we're also joined by Andrew Wee and his cohort in St. Kitts and Nevis, who also recognized the need to participate in this particular training. ACM is proud to be able to assist and work with journalists around the region. This training is just one of the ways we as an association could assist in capacity building of our colleagues in the region. I want to get right into today's training and our first presentation comes from Justice Tatiana Waterman Lachu. And I will briefly uh, introduce Justice Lachu and her presentation. Uh, as you can see on the program, the title of the presentation, Bad Mouth, a Capsule Guide to the Law of uh, Defamation. Justice Waterman Lachu is a high court judge in Trinidad and Tobago and a former deputy director of public prosecutions. She also served as a high court judge in the Eastern Caribbean from November 2014 to May 2017. Before embarking on her legal career, she was a newspaper journalist for 16 years. She's the author of the text Newsroom Law, a legal guide for Commonwealth Caribbean journalists published by the UE Press. Justice Lachu also holds a Master of Science degree in Legal and Forensic Psychology. Newsroom Law, this is the only book of its kind, the market written by a, in the market, sorry, written by a journalist for journalists in the region. It is meant to guide, comfort, and support Caribbean journalists. It seeks to demystify libel laws, including the Reynolds Public Interest Defense. The book gives journalists a better understanding of the legal framework in which they operate so they can go about their business with greater confidence. As I welcome Justice Waterman Lachu this morning, I just want to um, urge my colleagues to observe the protocol, uh, just ensure that your mics remain on mute. Uh, you're welcome to have your cameras on. I mean, that, that is a sign of, you know, um, interaction and, and you paying attention. And uh, Justice Lachu, will, you will tell us, you know, what is comfortable with question and answer at the end, um, or if you don't mind interjection, uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Not too many people could get me out early on a weekend along yeah, I think it's a long weekend here, see? And here I am. But Kieran and Wesley asked me, and so how could I say no? All right, feel free to um, post questions in the chat. I'll ask someone to monitor the chat for me because I won't be able to monitor it while I'm presenting and we will field the questions. I have titled the presentation, as you see, Bad Mouth, because that's what we say here, bad mouthing someone, right? In our Creole, we say move along. Now there are many areas of law 
that affect journalists and we couldn't possibly cover all. So I thought I would focus on libel or defamation, which is the area that concerns journalists most of the time. Can't cover everything. The objective of this presentation is to help train your spidey senses so that when you are navigating a story, an investigation, a report, you will be on alert. Something will tingle and you'll say, wait, let me stop, pause. Let me check this. Let me call an attorney. Let me talk to the editor. Let me consult a text. There are some things that will be red alert. Others have nuances and you can't get it all in one workshop. The important thing is to sensitize and put you on alert so that you can ask further questions and have further sessions of this nature. So let's go. Now it has always been, always, always, always been a bad thing to bad mouth people. Think of the thundering biblical Warning in Leviticus, do not be a pit tail bearer among your people. If you had to do Shakespeare in school, remember Othello? And the treacherous, the treacherous friend who was pouring poison in his ear. Remember that speech, who steals my purse steals trash, but he that filches from me my good name. So people's reputation, their sense of dignity, that's what people value the most. More than love, more than money, people value their reputation the most and they will try to protect it. They will go to all ends to protect it. Even when they know they are scoundrels, they want their reputation, their dignity to be protected. So once upon a time back in, in, in the UK, this is how men used to settle their insults, people would have duels. And then the king said, hey, too many people dying like this. The nobility is being decimated <laughs> because they're killing one another in duels. Yes, you would slap someone in the face with your glove and you'd have a duel. So I think it was King James probably back in the 17th century said, hold up. And people started going to court to settle insults or tax upon their honor. Now, you may ask, well, where do the rules come from? How do we know what we can publish, what we cannot publish? Where do these rules come from? Well, there are different sources of law and best place to start is the constitution because the constitution is trumps. The constitution trumps everything. This is your protection. So in the Bailey's constitution, for example, freedom of expression is protected. So this is not particular to journalists. This is for everyone. As journalists, what we do is we honor, we respect, and we invoke that freedom of expression that belongs to everybody. And we give voice to people who ordinarily wouldn't have that voice. We have a platform. So it's an honor and a privilege. So freedom of expression is protected. And in, notice that it includes the freedom to hold opinions and the freedom to receive ideas. People can't receive ideas and information unless somebody is imparting it. So it's the freedom to impart and receive ideas, the freedom to communicate ideas and information without interference. But as you know, all freedoms and all rights have restrictions. So as one judge stated, this is a Trinidad and Tobago case, freedom of speech and expression are guaranteed by the constitution, but they do not give license to anyone to make unfounded statements, unfounded statements about other persons. All rights have to be balanced. So the law seeks to balance reputation and dignity with freedom of expression. Where else does, do the rules come from? the Libel and Defamation Act. They go by different names in the region, but generally it's either the Libel and Slander Act or the Defamation Act or the Libel and Defamation Act. So the statute itself, when you say statute, it means that piece of paper, that document that is passed by parliament, an act of parliament. So that's where the word act would come from in legislation. 
but the legislation doesn't cover everything. For example, the St. Kitts Libel Act is very short. It doesn't actually write down or state or specify everything. So where else do the rules come from? They come from something we call the common law or case law. So when judges are deciding cases, they don't say, let me see, what did I have for breakfast this morning? I feel I will do this today. No. We consult a body of law that has been building up for more than a hundred, for, for decades, for hundreds of years. We consult laws that could go back as far as the 18th century. We consult how, how other jurisdictions, other courts in the Commonwealth, similar history and similar law, how they decide the same issue. So you will see me referring to cases from the UK, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, even Africa, because we have a similar history of foundation. So we don't repeat ourselves. We don't think up a decision afresh. We consult that body of jurisprudence, All right? That's a nice big word that we use, the jurisprudence, that body of law that has been building up beautifully over the decades. So the common law case law. All right. So what is defamation? You've heard me say libel, you've heard me say slander, you've heard me say defamation. Defamation is an umbrella too. And it includes libel and slander. Now libel is used for words published in a permanent form. So newspapers, magazines, websites, slander is transient, spoken words, right? So if somebody curses you out in public, that's slander. Now, why is this important? It's important because in some jurisdictions, we can't make up our mind whether radio and television are transient or permanent, libel or slander. Websites are considered permanent because it's stored in a permanent fashion. Now, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have had different courts, different judges saying that the television broadcast or radio broadcast was permanent, so it's libel. And we have had some saying it's slander. Some states, in their wisdom, thank God, decided the difference doesn't matter and by legislation. Barbados and Jamaica said, by legislation, we are abolishing any distinction between libel and slander. Guyana says, for, uh, for the purpose of libel and slander, broadcast is considered permanent. Bailey's in its proposed new legislation, it proposes to remove that distinction between libel and slander. And it's pro in my view, that's probably the better way to go. I won't go into the details, but the reason for the distinction, it has to do with how, with the ease of which somebody can prove their case. But in my view, the distinction, it is better to remove the distinction. So what is it to libel someone? What is it to, to, to defame someone? Well, if you make allegations that someone has committed a shameful act, he stole money from his boss, all right? He stole my purse. He's of a shameful character. He's dishonest, he's a liar, has engaged in a shameful course of action, or has a shameful condition. Once upon a time, smallpox was considered a shameful condition. And if you suggested or said somebody had smallpox, you are defaming the person. H the HIV AIDS is still considered something that would attract defamation or defamation suit if you can't prove it or if you're incorrect. Someone, um, I did a similar presentation in Nairobi, Kenya for African journalists and someone said that um, COVID-19 in some communities, that's a scary thing. It would have that effect to so suggest somebody has COVID-19, that could also be defamation. Right. So this is a phrase you would hear, words tending to lower the plaintiff in the estimation of right-thinking members of society generally. So it sounds a little archaic, but that's the phrase that you will hear. Words tending to lower the plaintiff, the plaintiff is the claimant, 
claimant is the term you would hear used more frequently now. The person was saying, I am aggrieved, I am aggrieved. My character has been, you, you have defamed me. You have attacked me wrongfully. Words tending to lower the claimant in the estimation of right-thinking members of society. So it's sort of the reasonable man or woman, the view of the reasonable man or woman. This is a Canadian case that contains a definition of defamation. And this case is used by courts all over the, um, the English, all over the Commonwealth. So that's where it comes from. I didn't just make it up. All right, so if you call someone a thief, a liar, a hypocrite, or a racist, or you suggest it, Nobody has to tell you that is defaming somebody. Nobody has to tell you that that's libelous. And you would be aware of it. You would be on alert. That would catch your attention. But this is where it gets a little sticky sometimes for journalists. If something's a frontal attack, you can recognize it. If you are editing copy, you would say, what is this? You can't say this. How could you write this? Where's the proof for this? It would leap out at you. But there are other areas that do not immediately declare themselves if you're not attuned or trained to recognize. So here are some words to be cautious about. Describing someone as the first or the only person with a particular skill can be defamatory. Why? Let's think about it. Why? If I were to say, that Dr. X is the only surgeon who performs this procedure or the only surgeon to perform this procedure successfully. He's the first person. He's pioneering this type of surgery. He's the first surgeon to do this. And three other surgeons or two other surgeons step up and say, hello, hold on. I have been doing this for the last five years. What are you talking about? Indirectly, I have defamed those other surgeons or the other surgeon because what I'm suggesting is that they are not qualified. They have been performing these procedures that they're not qualified to because I've just said Dr. X is the only person who could do it. So anybody else who's professing to do it is a quack. So you see the difference between a frontal attack, a direct statement, and something less direct. So you have to be wary of those words. Be careful. You have to check it. You have to call the reporter and say, are you sure about this? The doctor is telling you this, but are you sure? Can you check with the medical board or with somebody else to make sure somebody else hasn't done this? All right. To call someone a liar, you have to be careful. A liar means the person is a habitual liar, not a fibber. If you catch someone out in an untruth, you just state that. But if you put the label lie on it, that could be defamatory. Now, the amount of money I might get in compensation might be limited because the court might say, well, okay, you told a lie, you're not a habitual liar, but take $5 and go, all right? Take $3,500 and go. But the point is, you have still said something libelous. So be careful. Sometimes some simple editing of one word, a sentence, a phrase can make a story watertight irregularity or fraud. Now, every year in Trinidad and Tobago, every so often the Auditor General's report is published. That's an audit of the public service. And every time you go through it, you see that there are irregularities. Irregularity and fraud are two different things. So let us say you're working on an investigation on let's say a big construction project. And there are reports that the tendering process, there have been breaches of the tendering process. Yes, you, you might be able to prove that there are breaches of the tendering process, but that's not the same as corruption. If you're going to take that leap from breaches of a procedure to corruption, you better be able to support that. Otherwise, take out the word corruption, just say what you can prove. There have been breaches of the tendering process. You can say someone did a bad performance. It's not wise to say the person is a bad musician, a bad actor, because that's, that's a general character attack as opposed to one bad performance. 
here's another area in which people need to be, in which people get, um, they can lose their way. Innuendo, innuendo, the things not said, but said. I didn't turn that, we say du blantan, double meaning. In Calypso, Cal Calypsonians are famous, good Calypsonians are famous for du blantan. I remember um, Chuck that's in, in a Calypso once said, you don't call a man a lie, you say he's a stranger to the truth. So the art of saying something without saying it. However, that doesn't protect you from a defamation suit. It might be clever. You might think, oh, what a lovely turn of phrase I have used there. I didn't call him a liar. No, the law is going to see through that. So the thing not said, but said. Let me give you some examples. Context is everything. The context of the phrase or the sentence or the article can change the complexion of the story. Who recognizes what popular movie this scene is from? Come on. Don't pretend you don't watch silly movies. <laughs> Nobody recognizes this scene. I think it's Legally Blonde, yes. Yes, <laughs> Legally Blonde. <laughs> All right. So in this case, the character in the scene is accused of murdering her husband and she has an ironclad alibi. She couldn't have done it because she was getting liposuction. But she refused to let the lawyers use that in court because she was a fitness guru. And if her public knew that her assets were the result of liposuction and not her fitness workout, it would destroy her. And she was prepared to pre protect her reputation. She was prepared to go to jail rather than have her reputation destroyed. So the point about this is, if you said anybody else had cosmetic surgery or had liposuction and it wasn't true or you couldn't prove it, the person might be annoyed. But is it necessarily defamatory? Is it defamatory to say somebody is getting cosmetic surgery? Probably not, unless the person's reputation is going to be damaged. So if I was starring in a shampoo commercial. Yes, and I was saying, oh, use the shampoo. Look at my lovely, luxurious hair. You use the shampoo. And then you said, it's actually a um, hair transplant. You'd be damaging my reputation. That would be libelous. So context, the context changes everything. Let me give you my favorite example of this. This is my second favorite. This one is my favorite. This is an actual court case, the Times newspaper in the UK. Now the Sunday Times reported incorrectly, Russia's richest woman buys a London mansion for millions of pounds. So on the face of it, what's libelous about that? You buy a mansion, you didn't buy a mansion, who cares? All right, it looks like just celebrity gossip. Now, the Times was incorrect when it said Russia's richest woman buys a London mansion for millions of pounds. They couldn't prove that she bought it. All right, so it was incorrect. All right, so it might be annoying, but how is that defamatory? If you're rich and you buy, you don't buy. What does that have to do with anything? Now, this was the sting in it. This is the sting. The thing not said, but which is said. This... Claimant was the wife of the mayor of Moscow and required under Russian law to declare assets. For example, in Trinidad, we have the Integrity Act. Do you have that in Belize, where certain officials, public officials, have to declare their assets? Anyway, you'd be familiar with what I'm talking about, the type of legislation I'm talking about. So the innuendo, the thing not said but said, is that she was hiding assets because there was no declaration of the London mansion in her declaration of assets. So if you are stating that she has a London mansion but it's, and it's not declared, the innuendo is she's hiding assets. But of course she didn't buy the London mansion. So by that inaccuracy, the Times had libeled this millionaire. 
So it's a thing not said, but said, innuendo, innuendo. Here's an example from Belize. This is the case of Lawrence and Lightburn. I don't know if those names mean anything to you. All right, so the claimant, Lightburn, was a politician. And a newspaper reported he was a prime suspect, those are the words used, in a stabbing incident. His opponent, Bobby Smith, a few days before the city council elections. Now let's pause here. If that is all that was reported, there's a, there was a stabbing incident, Bobby Smith was stabbed at such and such a place, um, and Mr. Lightburn is the prime suspect. If that is all was reported, what do you think? Is that defamatory? This is a safe zone, so you can speak up. Is that defamatory? What do you think? Was an attack of his character. Yeah. Not hearing. I would say it's an attack on his character. Right. It can be. And um, the court at first instance found that it was, but the appeal court actually, and this should give you some comfort as journalists when you're reporting police, police type cases. But it's good. I'm very glad that you recognize that this is this is something that your spidey senses should tingle over, and you should pause. Yes, the um, appeal court actually said that once there is no further allegation suggesting that he had actually committed the act, that it was okay. Mm -hmm. So if the newspaper had stopped right there it would probably have been all right. The case might have been set, would probably have been settled in um, favor of the newspaper. But this is where it got into trouble. It went on to say that Mr. Lightbill and his gang of paid henchmen were on the scene shortly before the Bash and Juk incident. So you see that phrase, gang of paid henchmen? That was the nail in the coffin. If they had just stopped at saying he was this incident happened and he was a suspect, once that was true, that he was a suspect and the police were investigating and questioning him or whatever, that would have been okay. But when the newspaper went further and said his gang of paid henchmen, he and his gang of paid henchmen were on the scene shortly before the incident. What are you saying? But not saying. You're saying he probably took, took part in it. So that is where the libel arose. So sometimes I said, it's the thing not said, but said. It's not always the frontal attack. Now, this is why, this is why we have to be careful. This, this is an example of how damages, that's the word that we use, damages. It means compensation that people have to pay, media houses have to pay when they're found to be at fault. All right. Uh, Harry Hanheinerein and Robin Montana, that's a Trinidad and Tobago case. Harry Hanheinerein represented a credit union that collapsed financially. And Robin Montana was a lawyer and he wrote letters, sort of demand letters for his clients. And Harry Hanherein on a radio station lambasted Robin Montano. And this is some of the phrases he used. He said, he referred to the letter as a racist, nasty letter. And he said, Montano, plain Indian friend. Because as the name suggests, the Hindu credit union was not totally, but it was associated with um, Hindus or the, or the Indian, Indian um, clans. It wasn't, it wasn't restricted to them, but as the name suggests. So that's where the racist and Indian came in. So of course he was calling Mr. Montano a racist. So the damages, 250,000 TT, which is about 99,000 EC dollars. Let's look at the one to the right. This one is from um, Jamaica, the Gleaner versus Abrams, 5.3 TT million. You're seeing it there on the, on the screen. Two point, about 2.4 Eastern Caribbean million. Now, this is a, a, a warning that just because something comes from foreign or it comes on a, on a reputable wire service, you don't just grab it up and say, it must be okay. 
you have to watch it with a gimlet eye like everything else. Now, an Associated Press report was published and it referred to bribes, suspected bribes from an American advertising firm associated with the claimant, Mr. Abraham. But now that report had been released in error by Associated Press. The journalist had not completed her inquiries and the report was um, released in error and the Gleaner published it. And Mr. Abrahams was very much hurt. He was a government minister. And he even said in, his, in the court matter that when it came out, his mother who was abroad called him and without asking any questions, she started to, to lambaste him. So he gave that in evidence. Just a minute, let me, I, I, let me double check if it was that case or another case. Just checking my notes, chapter 16. Might be another case. All right, no, that was another case. Sorry, that was another case. But Mr. Abrahams was um, a government minister, and so it was very damaging to him. So that show that is an indication of the size of the compensation award. Here's another one. This one is from Guyana. It illustrates that cartoons, anything that is published, can be libelous. It's not just the news report, it's not just the opinion page. Even cartoons can be libelous. There was an article published about a neurosurgeon and it was very unflattering of him, but it suggested he was of unsung mind, incompetent, he was a dictator. But look at the caption on the cartoon, madness knows no bounds and there was a caricature of him. That is libeling the claimant. It's not a defense to say, oh, it was just a joke, it was satirical. It was just a comment. That's not a defense. The example to the right, that's a case from 2013, two politicians, 250,000 TT dollars were awarded. The allegation was that the candidate was taking bribes. He was an independent candidate in an election. And the allegation was that he was taking bribes from a more established, from an established political party and the where was the where was the allegation made at two media conferences and the the defendant the other politician he had hired a car with a loud speaker and broadcasted it throughout the community so that's a reminder that it's not just print it's not just radio it's not just an op it's not just an opinion it can be a cartoon it can be a loudspeaker on top of a motor car it can be sign writing, using a plane, a plane to, to write on the sky, hiring a sign writer. Once it's published, it's capable of the, being defamatory. Do you know that um, captions can be defamatory? Headlines too, but the court will look at the entire article. So if the headline is a little off, the court would look at the entire article if because the House of Lords in England has said that newspapers are not published for people who just read the headline and move on. So the court will look at the overall effect, the entire article. How do you think captions can be defamatory? What can make a caption defamatory? Have you ever come across that? Have you ever encountered that experience? Anybody? Well, one way is that you can put... Um, you can have a photograph, let's say somebody, a convicted child molester, and you mix up his photograph with a law abiding person on the same page. That's how a caption could be um, defamatory. Another way is if you misidentify somebody, you say, um, Mr. and Mrs. Brown. But suppose any person in the, in the picture is not Mr. Brown or the woman in the picture is not Mrs. Brown. Without intending to, you would have defamed somebody because people who know the real Mr. Brown and the real Mrs. Brown will say, hey, hey, I, I didn't know you had, he's a bigamist. 
I know it sounds a little, <laughs> a little unusual, but that's the reality. The point to remember is that captions, cartoons, photographs can be defamatory. To the left, I have, this is a South African case. A deputy headmaster sued three schoolboys over a caricature. Successfully sued three schoolboys over a caricature. They were just being schoolboys, but nevertheless, they are defamed because the caricature had homosexual imputations. And that is still capable of being defamatory. Opinions and views may have changed about um, homosexuality, but it can still be defamatory. You may have a view of it, but if you incorrectly suggest or say someone is homosexual, that person can sue for libel. Advertisements, you know advertisements could be defamatory? Yes, they can. <laughs> I'll give you an example. This is something that actually used to happen. Now, people in relationships do all kinds of things. I don't know why, but it happens. People have actually tried. Let's say someone is in a relationship. Um, let's say I'm married. This is an example I know of. Married man and a woman that may or may not have been in a relationship, and she may have been under the impression they were in a relationship. And she tried to or actually did take out an ad, birthday greetings. Some newspapers allow people to buy ad space, wishing their loved ones happy birthday or anniversary. And she took out an ad to my loving husband on his have a happy birthday from your darling wife. Of course, she wasn't the wife. Yes, people do all sorts of things. The actual case is like that. There's a case from the early 1900s in England where someone took out an advertisement congratulating someone on the birth of twins. But they had only been married a few months. So, of course, it, it's the innuendo was that it had been lived an unchaste life before they got married. Now, in the early 1900s, this was defamatory. So, it was some sort of revenge, revenge advertisement. That is defamatory. So you don't get an excuse for saying, well, it was in the advertisement section, not on the front page. All right. What about cyber libel? What about internet, Twitter, a podcast, Facebook, or the metaverse? There are no exceptions, really. At a click, you can become a publisher. And if you're a publisher, you can be sued. Media houses are responsible for articles on their websites, as well as in print. Now, many newspapers, many media houses have an internet presence. They have a social media presence. And readers or followers are allowed to post their comments. So, a perfectly respectable article may be published, and then people, readers, are allowed to post their comments about the article. Do you know you're responsible for those comments if they're defamatory? <laughs> so let's say you publish a perfectly safe and correct article about, let's say a court case, a high-profile court case, and somebody published, somebody posts a comment saying, um, the judge must have got paid off. That is not justice. People taking bribes. You are responsible for that because you are hosting the website. So if you're permitting comments, you have to have a mechanism whereby you can screen and remove those comments. Indeed. Um, no? Yes? Uh, if I can just interject, um, I, it happened to me earlier this year, as a matter of fact, there was a a matter involving a prominent attorney. I think it was the publishing of the Panama Papers or whatever it was, and, and his name was linked. He had sent out a statement specifically denying uh, the charges, and he ran that story. Uh, apparently, without my knowledge, someone posted a, a, a particular comment under the story, and I think a couple days later, we got a 
letter by email, I believe it was from this attorney's attorney, who is another senior attorney, uh, and basically indicated, we don't have a problem with your story, but there was a caption, or not a caption, a, a comment under the story that it is considered the commentary, and so we have to hold you accountable. Thankfully, we settled it, but um, I, we had actually, I, I believe we had deleted the comment almost immediately after it was posted, but still not quite enough to yes. uh, send that particular letter. Thankfully, it was addressed, but yes, that is an example. Yes, the first thing, if it gets slipped past, take it down immediately. Because very often people just want it down. They may not particularly want money from you. Sometimes you might say, well, look, just pay my legal costs. I paid the lawyer $800 to write the letter. Just cover that and we'll be fine. So you have to take it down immediately once you allow that facility. facility. Similarly with radio programs, radio talk show, once you invite comments from the public, you have to have a mechanism whereby you can shut it down. You can't take the risk of people blurting out any old thing on your program. If it happens to slip by, as I said, you have to shut it down and immediately withdraw it and divorce yourself from it. Don't ever make it look as if you are adopting what was said. Here's an example. This is an actual case. This is um, Sally Burkow. She was the wife of the, was it the leader of the opposition? In um in the UK now don't yeah. beg pardon. Speaker, I believe. All right. Oh, now, look, speaker, I will be John Burkow. Yes, yes, House Speaker. Yes, Lord um McAlpin, Lord McAlpin had been wrongfully, 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 wrongfully accused. I say wrongfully because nobody could prove it, right? So it was. All right. Let me rephrase, and I'm not suggesting he did something, and they just couldn't prove it. Right? He was wrongfully accused of or associated with sexual misconduct. And there was a news, news program the night before, and Sally Burkow tweeted, why is Lord McAlpine trending? Innocent face. Yes, wife of, the, she was wife of the Speaker of the House of Commons. Now, Lord McAlpin was a close aide to Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister. And this is what the tweet read. Why is Lord McAlpin trending innocent things? And the court said that was rooted in innuendo because the followers of Twitter would have been familiar with the context, the context based on the Newsnight program two days before. The court ruled that the statement was defamatory because readers would understand it to mean that the claimant was a pedophile who sexually abused boys. The tweet had appeared two days after a Newsnight report that had wrong, wrongly implicated Lord McAlpin in a sex abuse scandal at children's homes. So Sally Burkow apologized for her irresponsible use of Twitter. So those are her words, the irresponsible use of Twitter. And Lord McAlpine also received damages from BBC and ITV and from a comedian who had retweeted the defamatory Twitter post. So just retweeting, reposting makes you a publisher and liable. It's similar to someone placing a letter in your letterbox, old fashioned, old school, write a letter, write a nasty note about your neighbor, place it in your letterbox. You retrieve it from your letterbox, and instead of keeping it to yourself or disposing of it, you copy it and you drop it in the letterboxes of other people. You have repeated it, you have published it, and that can make you liable. So journalists, like everybody else, they use the technology, and you have to be careful about reposting things, even as part of your function as a journalist, because as I said, media houses use the technology too. So just retweeting something, reposting it, republishing it, posting it can get you in trouble. So who can be sued? People often ask me this. All right, the Shaggy defense, you know this fella, Shaggy? 
Come on, you must yes, know Shaggy. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, you know his famous song, It Wasn't Me. All right. So the, the Shaggy defense is not available to you <laughs> in libel cases. So everyone in the chain of defamation can be sued. The person who first uttered the remark. So let's say you have an interview with someone. Let's say there's a disgruntled employee and you have an interview with the disgruntled employee. You publish it. You, the reporter types it up. The editor publishes it. Everyone is liable, including the person, the disgruntled employee, the journalist himself or herself who wrote it, the editor who permitted it, the publisher, if it's radio or TV, the talk show host, the publisher or the broadcast station, everyone is liable. Now, journalists are usually people of straw, so the person who's really going to pay is you, is, the, is your media house. And they will deal with you afterwards. The person who first uttered the remark may also be a person of straw. So again, it's you, the journalist and your media house that will pay. Good morning, back at the media. Um, can I ask a question now or at the end of no, the- No, ask the question, ask the question. Go ahead, Devin. Okay, yeah, I don't like- I don't really Where are like you from? It, but, Where are um, you from, Devin? Where are you from? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, back at the media from St. Kitts. All right, nice to meet you. What's the yeah. question? Um, one, in terms of um, getting sued, so for example, if me as a media house carry a story, right and mm -hmm. there are other media house who carries it but um don't get sued mm -hmm. what is there anything i can do no by saying that it is unfair that only no. they get sued no. and not the other houses and no that we have why. all known let me tell you why we have all known since we were six years old it's not a defense to say it wasn't me alone johnny and mary was there too <laughs> all right <laughs> the claimant might have his or her reasons why they're going after you as opposed to the other media houses, but it doesn't work like that. Everybody has to stand his or her own bounds. Okay. The other question. Um, in terms of um, when someone is uh, arrested, right, for um, the accused of a murder or rape, well, let me not use rape, because rape is a, is a bit different. Let's say a murder. Uh, 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 stealing. As a media house, am I allowed to post the person picture and said that um, he or she was charged of this crime? Because I was told once that the person you can get has sued. Been charged, once the person has been charged, you are perfectly free to report the person has been charged with name, picture, DNA profile, anything you want to say, you can say to identify that person. Wonderful. Free to the report one to that now. charge. Now bear with me a little bit here. I can do a whole presentation on crime and court reporting. Bear with me here. Make sure the person has been charged. Sometimes police sources tell you, yeah, 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 they're charging them, they're going and charge him. And then next thing you know, the person hasn't been charged. All right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but the follow up question here. Now, uh -huh. The person now got a court and they won the case. Can they sue you no. for defamation of character? Because nope. you would have already um, put their picture out there. You didn't say they were they guilty. Are a murderer. You, you didn't so say saying, they were guilty. All right, listen to me. You are not going to call the person a murderer. You're not going to call the person a thief. You're not going to call the person a rapist. You are going to say John James has been charged for the offense of murder contrary to common law. He was charged by Constable Blue. Yes. Um, re relating to an incident that took place on December 21st, 2021. He appeared at the whatever court this morning or yesterday. So you're you're not saying so, the person is so, guilty, you're saying he was charged. So there's no room for the person to sue for none, defamation of character? None is, whatsoever. Is that what you're saying? No. Okay. Nice you had you. an experience? You had a bad experience? 
lots of them. <laughs> Maybe because, I can do um, another guy came to me. I can do another session me. on um, court and crime reporting. A guy came to me and he said that he asked me to remove um, his name from an article because um, he was charged and um, he went and he won the case. case. All right, right. But what you have to do is you have to. So my, same... lawyer, my lawyer advised me just to avoid, um, you know, drama and confusion to just remove it because it, 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 it didn't worth it. All right, he asked you to remove it. Well, I don't know about removing things because that means you're erasing history. All right, but here's what I suggest. But he was free. <laughs> listen, 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 listen to what I'm saying. You were not incorrect in saying he was charged. What you have to do, this is what people complain about. The same prominence you gave the fact he was charged, you have to publish that he was um, acquitted or the charge was dismissed. That's what people complain about. When I'm charged, big, bold headlines. But when I'm freed and I'm found not guilty, you either don't report it or you hide it somewhere in the corner. So with the same prominence, that's really the sting there. It's not the fact that he reported the person was, was charged and then he was later found not guilty. But you have to balance. You have to give him the same prominence. I don't really believe in removing removing. You mean from the archive something that was already published? Yes. So I actually had to well, I'm the right. I'm the host right. of my website so I just went and searched right. from the website. You can do that. You can do that. You can do that. If we go back and take out things, we're also erasing history because supposing I'm doing some research, it means, if you see what I mean, but you could do that if you want to, but it's not. Yeah, that but I mean, found. if you ask for, if you ask for, let's say you ask for the story that happened, me as the person who would have published it can provide um, some kind of information for you because I will have it steady. It's just that you won't be able to find it on my website because yeah. it's Sometimes already people removed. don't worry about the website because the website remains there. Things remain there in cyberspace forever. Well, and I know that, but in terms of um, actually that, physically... They feel that they are constantly being, um, being ripped apart for something that they have now been free. But the real way to deal with that, as I'm saying, is you have to publish the outcome as prominently as you published the, uh, the, um, the chart. But it's not about... It's not that is there any document? Uh, is there any documentation with this? Like in any laws that actually speak to this? You have to buy my book. Can't tell you everything here. <laughs> that, that's what that's what we have in this discussion. <laughs> right? That's what we have in this discussion. I can do a whole session on crime and, and court reporting. We can't cover everything here. Uh, okay, thanks for your time. You may continue. Okay. Sure. All right, so let's look at the defenses to defamation. Yes, this let you. Yes. Just a question. Sure. Uh, the example you used just now is a straight reporting where you say the person was charged for X and X um, crime. But sometimes in our writing, we get creative and we may say things like accused cop killer or accused wife killer. Well, he is an accused wife killer. If he is charged for, um, for killing a policeman, he is an accused cop killer. What's the problem with that? I just wanted to clarify because... Um, no, 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 that's quite all right. He is an accused cop killer. When you see... He's accused of killing a, killing a police officer. You're right. The, the headline is just putting it in shorthand. I ask because when um, our media houses are on social media, when the, when the story is published that way, people take exception to it. And so I, I ask that for the clarity. What? an exception to what exactly to take an exception to oh, um, it's because of the wording you know accused cop killer uh because she hasn't been convicted she's only accused but that's why you said accused right okay. i'm not seeing the difficulty look people will take offense with all kinds of things all right this is why we have these type of um workshops and so on so that you could have more confidence you will know when to back down and when to stand firm. So I don't see what it is to take an offense was accused. <laughs> it means you've been accused, not convicted. All yes. right. And, and, and that is the critical difference because, um, again, um, sorry, I, I, just to introduce here on news from Breaking Belief, news here in Belief. But um, we, as a media house, get a lot of requests to take down stories from two, three, four years ago, or even to take down current stories 
where the, the charges, where someone has been charged or went to court, even the, even the, 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 the appeal guilty, they, they, they don't want their names associated with. The, yes, uh, I can understand. If I have been freed of, I would like all, I would like to think, I, my instinct would be to just wipe it away. And this is where policy, where the law ends, ethics and policy have to take over. So you have to know your, your policy and your ethics in this situation, because once you start taking down for one or two people, what are you going to tell the others? Are you going to have every time someone is um, acquitted of something, you have to go back in now and take, take down? Where the law ends, ethics will take over. Indeed, indeed. And so we, we, yeah. very, we very sparingly, uh, uh, as, as, uh, as a media house, take down stories or remove, uh, but, but, but generally speaking, um, in terms right. of, uh, of, of posting, we will avoid names unless, in fact, the person has been charged. Right. Uh, and where persons are uh, acquitted and convicted, we, of course, run the story with the same provenance, as you said, as if they were originally uh, charged. So, All right. Like, I'm glad for the feedback. Uh, let me try and get through um, defenses, and then we'll see if we have some more time for discussion. Okay, so some, let's look, think of your defenses. Now, sometimes it's easier to say what is not a defense. It is not a defense to say, well, we didn't call any names. We just said um, a high ranking member of so-and-so, or we just said a senior police officer. Now, you can still identify someone without calling the name. Particularly if it's a closed group. If, for example, you say, all lawyers are crooks, or lawyer, lawyer or let me rephrase that. If you say lawyers are, are crooks, lawyers are crooks, Poli the police service is corrupt. All right, that's my alarm telling me how much time I have left, right? The police service is corrupt. You would not be defaming any one person, but if you say of lawyers, for example, all senior counsel, because that's a small group. Any member of that group can sue you. If you say all first division officers in a particular district, that's a small group. There might only be five people who fit that description. Any one of them can sue you. So just saying you didn't call names is not sufficient. Once I know who you're talking about, you would be exposed. We already pointed out just a saying, oh, it's just a joke, that's not a defense. Here's a tricky one. We gave both sides of the story. Merely, I don't want to, um, I'm trying to do it in a, in a capsule way. Let us say there's an allegation floating about social media, all right, on the street, gossip. People are saying that, let's say a, a government minister, took a bribe for something. And you think, well, look, this is a, a hot topic out there. I have to respond to it. So you call up the minister and the minister says, that is absolutely ridiculous. I took, I ran for office because I wanted to serve my people. I have never done a dishonest thing in my life. That is absolutely ridiculous. And you dutifully say, thank you. And you write the allegation and you write the response, the reply. Minister denied the allegation. She said she's here to serve and absolutely ridiculous allegation. You think, well, I gave both sides. That is not necessarily a parachute because you have repeated the allegation. So sometimes, even for the purpose of denying something or having it denied, you can open yourself to defamation because you're repeating the allegation. You're giving life or voice to something unproven out there. But we'll talk more about that as we go along. Now, the best defense is probably the defense of truth. This is a watertight, iron tight, fire safe defense. Now, I say this as many times I can, as forcefully as I can. Truth is not what you believe it to be. Truth is what you can prove. These two men, the images here of these two men illustrate what I told you, that people will go to all ends to protect their reputation, even when they know they are being scoundrels. These two men have in common a wondrous ability to tell lies. 
that's Jonathan Atkin on the left and Lance Armstrong on the right. You know that name, Lance Armstrong? He won the Tour de, Tour de, Tour de France. Tour de France. Yes, a cycling competition about five times. There were rumors for years that Lance Armstrong was doping. I remember seeing Lance Armstrong on Oprah saying, oh, that's just European jealousy. Everybody in America knows the truth. And the audience applauded. Of course, it turned out that Lance was a duper. Now, Lance successfully sued a publication for reporting that he was using performance enhancement drugs. He did. And eventually it was proven and he himself admitted that he was taking drugs. But the newspaper, the publication couldn't prove it at the time. So he got money out of them. Now it was reported that they asked back for the money and the matter was settled out of court. It was resolved out of court. But that's an illustration as I told you that people will go to all ends to protect their reputation. Jonathan Atkin, another famous, <laughs> another famous um, defamation case. Now, Jonathan Atkin was a conservative member of parliament in the UK, and he sued the Guardian and Granada Television for alleging that his hotel bill of 1,500 pounds at the Paris Ritz was paid by a businessman who was a close friend of the Saudi Arabian royal family. Now, that was a conflict of interest because he was involved in a defense deal with the Saudis. And listen to his self-righteous declaration when the article was published. He said, he intended to cut out the cancer of bent and twisted journalism with the simple sword of truth. All right, so he was quite pompous. The libel trial collapsed dramatically when the media houses, the defendants, proved he was lying when he testified that his wife had paid the bill because his wife was in Switzerland at the time. She wasn't even in Paris that weekend. He was sentenced to 18 months in prison for perjury and perverting the course of justice. But he's indestructible. He became a prison chaplain. He became ordained by the Church of England. And I think he's about seven, maybe about 80 years old now. He survived emergency surgery, two heart attacks. He's indestructible, it seems. <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey Archer, that's another famous one. He was Jeffrey Archer is a was a politician and also a, a, a multimillionaire novelist, right? And he extracted 500,000 pounds in damages from the Star tabloid after it reported that he had hired a prostitute. Now the prostitute herself gave evidence of their relationship and she described his physical appearance. She spoke of his spotty back and his wife gave evidence and said nothing of the kind. No, Jeffrey, Jeffrey's skin is immaculate. No, Jeffrey. That, that's not so. So the jury did not believe the prostitute. But about 12 years later in 1999, a friend of Jeffrey Archer's admitted that he had given Archer a false alibi to help him win his defamation case. So Archer was convicted of perjury and sentenced to four years in prison. So they got their comeuppance, all right? But few, few libel cases end so dramatically. Now, the case, this Canadian case I've highlighted there, Monroe, that's a cautionary tale because editors, yes, you support your, your journalists, your reporters, but make sure you know the evidence that they have. In Monroe, the reporter kept saying, yes, yes, I have the evidence here. And he, and he would point his pocket and he had a microfiche. In the 80s, we use microfiche. In his pocket, yes, I have it here. But the editors never asked to see it. They were a little bit afraid of him, it seemed. And he would get um, combative and upset when they tried to pin him down. And then when the, when the article was published and the Toronto Sun was sued, he said he had lost it. So you know what happened there. So make sure you have the evidence in your hot little hands before you publish, if you wish to rely on the defense of truth. Fair comment on a matter of public interest. Now you're entitled to your opinion and you can be as obnoxious as you like in your opinion, but your opinion has to be rooted on a provable fact. This is a Nevis case, Beulah Mills and Nevis Broadcasting. The 
the person commenting had said she was a disgrace to her profession and she should be removed because she had incorrectly registered non-nationals to vote. And in her claim, she said she was humiliated and it was very damaging to her and so on. However, she did not win her claim. The court found in favor of Nevis Broadcasting. Why? Because she had incorrectly registered non-nationals as voters. She had made that mistake. So the comment may have been hurtful to her, but it was based on a provable fact. So no, you can't just comment and hurl abuse at people and say, well, it's my opinion. You have to hook it on something provable. All right, we'll just go through very quickly privilege. You know what privilege applies to? Parliamentary reporting, courtroom reporting. Once you accurately and fairly report what is said in court or in parliament, you are free, you are covered, you are protected. Lawful public meetings, media conferences, government or court appointed inquiry, for example, commissions of inquiry. Right now, we have a commission of inquiry into children's homes taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. Ombudsman's report, all those are examples of privileged occasions. If you're caught out, you can apologize. That will limit your, the amount of money you have to pay. People like booksellers and internet service providers, they would fall under innocent dissemination. They have no control over what is published. Limitation, now this is an area that the proposed Bailey's, the new libel act is seeking to amend. Limitation means how much time the claimant has to file a suit. Right now, it's about six years. It's six years in Billy's and St. Kitts, but in the proposed amendment, they wish to reduce it to two years. So within two years, the person who is aggrieved has to say, I'm aggrieved and file a suit. Now we have a little time left, and I just want to emphasize this particular type of defense. It's called the Reynolds privilege. Sometimes it's called the public interest defense the public interest defense. It originated in England with the Sunday Times in 1999. Has anybody used it? Have you read about it? Have you tried it? Are you familiar with it? No? All right, you'll tell me in the chat. Now, why is this important? This is important because sometimes you can't rely on truth as your defense, meaning some parts of your publication you may not be able to prove. When the pre-action protocol letter comes and the claimant says, we deny this, we deny that this is wrong, this is wrong, you have defamed me. And you're put to proof, you might find rats. Mm, that one paragraph, I can't really back it up. Or you might even be forced to admit, yeah, I really got that wrong, you know, I made a mistake there. What the court says in these circumstances is that even though parts of the publication are inaccurate, you will still be protected once you demonstrated responsible journalism and the publication was in the public interest. Now, what does in the public interest mean? It doesn't mean things the public are interested in because the public could be interested in what Meghan Markle had for breakfast, all right? It has to be something of genuine public interest. Let's say, Supposing unsafe drugs are about to be released on the, on the public. Supposing there's a concern about tainted baby food. Something in the gen, something of public health interest, for example. So it's not a license to publish untruths, but the law recognizes that journalists are often working against the clock. They have a lot of information coming at them. They do, may not have time. The story may not, can the story keep? If unsafe drugs are being released out there, unsafe vaccines, fake vaccines are being released on the public, do you have time really to hold this story? There may be a certain urgency. And the law recognizes, and the law does support journalists, the law recognizes that there may be certain occasions when you may make errors, not through carelessness or sloppiness or malice, but you can still be protected because you practice responsible journalism. So Reynolds arose from an Irish scenario and 
Albert Reynolds, the Prime Minister, was accused of misleading the Parliament. And this is what the House of Lords says. It says, in some situations, the media have a duty to impart information to its readers. Information that the public has a legitimate interest in receiving. And this is where, this is an example of how the court support journalists. Lord Nichols said the court should be slow to conclude that the publication was not in the public interest. Should be slow to conclude that a publication was not in the public interest. Especially when the information is in the field of political discussion. So how do you show, show that you demonstrated responsible journalism and that you come under the protection of this type of defense? There are a number of things the court will look at. For example, the court will look at the steps taken to verify the information. And we have a session this morning on verification. So what would be reasonable verification? Well, I can tell you what it is not. Sticking a microphone in someone's face five or 10 minutes before publication deadline, door stepping someone and sticking a microphone in their face saying there's an allegation. So, so, so would you like to comment? I don't think that satisfies <laughs> the verification criteria, all right? Um, if you send an email to someone, one email, you have no record of whether the person received it. It might have been after hours. The person might have been out of the country. The person might have been away from their device. So you send one email again a few hours before publication. And you say, well, we tried to get, we tried to get so-and-so for comment and he was unavailable. The court is going to see through that. The seriousness of the allegation, the more serious the charge, the more the public may be misinformed and the individual harmed if the allegation is not true. The source of the information. Do your sources have direct knowledge or are they repeating something that they themselves heard? Do they have their own access to grind? Are they being paid for their stories? Those are some of the criteria. The court is particularly concerned about the tone of the article. And this is where you can protect yourself. You are publishing an allegation. You may not be able, or you're not attempting to say, this is exactly what happened here. You may not be in a position to say that, but it is of sufficient public interest that you can call for an investigation. You can ask for further clarification on the matter. You can say that the minister of such and such should give us an explanation on this. The director of agriculture is mandated to look into this. So the tone of the article is very important. You, to benefit from the Reynolds defense, you have to maintain a neutral tone. You're not accusing anyone of specific wrongdoing. You are raising something for the public interest. You're flagging the public concern and calling for further clarification. In the, the same Reynolds case, which was against the Times, the Times lost that libel suit. You know why? Because they did not get the public official's version. Failure to get a comment or version from the person who is the subject of the allegation. So this is on the screen now, those are the elements that you would need to demonstrate. Some of the elements you would need to de demonstrate. A neutral tool. I'll just skip ahead because we're running out of time. I'll just talk about one case. This is the case that brought that defense of the Caribbean, Bonnick and the Glena Company in 2002. And this went to the Privy Council, which is still the final court of appeal in many Caribbean states. So it's binding. Now, the Privy Council said it was kind of borderline because there was only one source who was anonymous and it didn't include the claimant's version. So that's not recommended. You should, should try to have more than one source. And you should always try to get the subject of the article's view. But this is why the Gleaner was protected. Overall, the report was even handed, leaving readers to make up their own mind. 
the tone overall was even-handed. This concerned Mr. Bonnick, who was the managing director of a government company engaged in a dispute with Belgian milk exporters over payments. And the article implied that he had been dismissed, that his dismissal was connected with irregularities in the company. So that was the sting in the report. So that's an example of how the Reynolds defense can be properly invoked. As I said, attempts to verify accuracy will be put under this spotlight. This is another case. This is from um, Dominica, is it? Yeah, Pinard, Byrne, and Linton. Pinard, Byrne is now deceased, I'm told. And Linton is now uh, an opposition politician, I believe. Now, this was a controversial Leu River project, and it was high profile. It was never completed. It ran into a lot of problems. Now, this thing in the report was suggested that Mr. Byrne, who was an accountant, knew of what was going wrong. They use the term squandermania. He knew of the squandermania and he benefited personally. That was the allegation. Now, the court said that Mr. Linton was very out of order in his publication because he made the allegations with absolutely nothing to back them up. He had no expertise in accounting himself. There was not a shred of evidence. He did no investigation and there was no attempt to speak to the claimant. So the court found that the report reeked of rancor rather than even-handed reporting. That term is very important, even-handed reporting. All right, this is a case from Trinidad and Tobago, which was kind of traumatic for the, the newspaper because they had appealed the um, they had appealed an aspect of it and the damages and the Court of Appeal increased the damages. They didn't lower it, they increased it. So it was kind of traumatic. Now, I am citing this case because I'm showing you the difference between how the reporter went about this investigation and the last case, two cases that I showed you. As I said in Bonnick, there was only one anonymous source and there was no comment from the public official. In this case, the reporter was very diligent. There were eight articles. She conducted lengthy interviews. She did considerable research and she interviewed Mr. Allion, who was the chairman of the airline, British BWIA airline. And she interviewed him for four hours and she had sources. So you see the difference in approach. This was a very in-depth, lengthy investigation, but yet the, re the reporter, the newspaper was still, still did not succeed in invoking the Reynolds defense. Why? The court said, although the subject of the interview was interviewed, the most serious allegations were not put to him. And the sources used had their own access to grind. This is another um, Trinidad and Tobago case. Again, the tone of the article, the newspaper lost and had to pay damages because the courts found the tone was overheated and sensational. No attempt at verification. No mention of the claimant's response. Now I had told you that sometimes it is not sufficient to say I gave both sides of the story, that that will not protect you. And that is true, but there's a, an, an exception. There's a special and rare form of Reynolds privilege, which I, I said is sometimes called the public interest, public interest defense. A special and rare form, note my words, rare. <laughs> In these cases, the fact of the allegations, the fact that there's a feud, for example, is what you're reporting. You're not saying who's right and who's wrong. You're not taking a side. But the fact of the allegations and counter allegations, that is the story and you're reporting that. You're not commenting on truth or falsity. You do not adopt or endorse the allegations. So here's an example. There were two factions of a British National Party. They were feuding. And the allegation was that they had threatened to kneecap their rivals. So the report was safe, if you want to use that word, because the report took a neutral tone and it was reporting the fact of the feud the fact of the allegations and counter allegations. So this is a special and rare form of 
the Reynolds defense. All right, I'm just gonna give you one scenario and tell me what you think. Let me find a good one for you. All right, this one. You're all editors and this comes across your desk. Let's go through it quickly. The Daily Register understands that cocaine with a street value of US 4 million was discovered concealed in a shipment of electronic equipment at the port yesterday. The equipment was shipped to an address in Greentown, which is the home of a prominent government minister who's a member of the cabinet. Police are investigating. As editors, would you do anything about that with your spidey senses tingle? What would you say to the um, journalist? What would you do? Anything they're alarming you or concerning you? Well, um, Glenn, Glenn Bart from SK Newsline. Um, I think the statement went off the rails when it made reference to um, the address and particularly to indicate it's the home of a prominent government minister. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that is where the issue um, would become um, yes. of, 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 of interest and yes. difficulty. Yeah. yeah, a simple editing could make this story safe, not so? Simple yes, editing. yes. Uh -huh. Simply by, by um, yes. um, mm -hmm. um, perhaps not indicating um, yeah. the idea that um, it's, it's a minister and especially up in the cabinet. Um, yeah, because that's a small group. It narrows it small down. group, you're narrowing it down. Yeah. Yeah, um, so any member of the cabinet, perhaps. And then yeah. you say, live in Greentown. So you're practically calling his name without calling his name. Right. And exactly. from my own viewpoint, anytime you see an article telling you anything about so and so understands, be on the alert. I don't know what that term means. To me, either you have the facts or you do. So anytime I read the Express understands, the Daily Blah understands, my spidey senses are going haywire. So that's what I have to share with you today. Do we have time for questions? I saw some questions in the chat. We do. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask um, Ms. Weir and, and Glenn uh, have questions in the chat. I'm just going to ask Ms. Weir, do you want to ask it? Uh, please use the opportunity to do so now. And Glenn, if you can, just ask your question. Uh, the group that is with uh, Deirdre, uh, please go ahead and also ask your questions. Hi, yes. Good morning, Shasta Wade from Plus TV. Um, I was just what asking- What country, what country? Please, sorry, please. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I was asking because you were talking about um, that restricted group um, saying all senior lawyers or all uh, yeah. senior cops. Um, is there a difference in terms of saying all senior lawyers or a senior lawyer when you're not calling a name in terms of a possible lawsuit? All right. As I said, context is every everything. I'm not sure what the phrase senior lawyer means, if it means long years of standing. All right. When we say senior counsel in the Caribbean, that's somebody who has been. The other phrase we use is has taken silk. They wear different robes and they and they call senior counsel. Long time they used to be called Queen's Counsel before we, before states became independent. They were called Queen's Counsel. Yeah. So if you say Queen's Counsel or senior counsel, you're in trouble because that's usually a very small group of people. All right. If you say a senior lawyer, I'm not sure what a senior lawyer means. I it's didn't not mean senior counsel. Senior counsel. I, I oh, didn't, I didn't mean senior, senior counsel. counsel. No, senior counsel is usually a very small group. You can say a prominent lawyer. Lots of lawyers are prominent. Got it. Thank you so much. All right. Yes. What else? All right. Uh, All right. Um, yeah. Glenn back here again from SK Newsline. Um, I had sort of raise the, the question about the concept of public figure. Mm. Um, I know in, in, um, in, in the US um, yes. environment, public figures can be open to a, a lot of criticism yes. without the fear of defamation and that kind of thing. All right, now I had actually written a paper on that once years ago, Paul is Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Wright, because the US case of um, Sullivan, which, dealt with this concept of public figure. 
Now, as nice and rosy as that sounds, it is not all smooth sailing in the United States with the public figure defense. Right? It sounds attractive, but every system has its positive and negative. All right, we do, the short answer is we do not have a public figure defense similar to the United States. What we have is the Reynolds public interest defense. Now, if someone is a public figure, it may well follow that what you are investigating may be of legitimate public concern, but we don't have that, that um, overarching public figure defense. Reynolds public interest defense is what we can rely upon via the, that case that I told you about, which is part of our legal landscape now. That's a thank short answer. <laughs> Thanks, okay, thank you very much. Deidre, um, any questions from your end? If there are no questions, I know Wesley made a comment also in the chat. I'm going to ask him to elaborate um, as we prepare to go into his presentation. Also, Wesley, you want to quickly elaborate on, on your point here? And I'm going to ask uh, Justice Waterman Latru to wrap up. Iran, sorry. Any... We were more... oh, oh, Nazima. <laughs> sorry, Nazima. Yes, I'm very, I'm very happy to see this um, comment because I wanted to come back to that. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I, yes, yes. yes um, Ernesto from Belize. Uh, Justice Lachu, how far can I de defend, depend on the word alleged to protect me? All right. Uh, it's a fig leaf which does not cover your important parts. <laughs> All right. Merely putting the word alleged, it's similar to putting the daily register understands. All right, merely putting alleged does not protect you. Sometimes there are legitimate reasons for using the word alleged. For example, I told you when you're saying someone has been charged, you're not saying the person did it. And you can say the prosecution alleges such and such took place, but it's not, it's not a parachute. I'm saying uh, John is the alleged killer. Once the person has been charged, you can say that. Well, not, not, not charged. Yeah. No, not charge. No, 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 no. Generally, no. I just wanted to point it out. We have a case coming up. Um, the leader of the opposition went on a talk show and spoke derogatory things about a prime minister mm. being sued. And he's saying, well, I didn't say any names. Well, it'd be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah, that would be interesting. But as I said, not calling names alone doesn't protect you once people know who you're talking about. There was, a, there was an issue that came up about removing stories and I was glad to see some because I wanted to come back to it. Nazima says stories should not be removed. You have to update the stories. Do not get in the habit of removing stories just like that. So I was very interested in hearing what other people thought about that because that, that's pretty much my view. Any further comment on that? Well, I, I had commented that there's a danger of um, imposing a, a, a regime of, of self-censorship. Yeah, I'm now seeing it, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a route to self-censorship. And very yeah. often it's mainly the people with, in, with, with power and influence who are the ones who will reach out to a publication to have yeah. the thing drawn and would be influential enough to, to actually yeah. have it removed. So I think it's a dangerous path. Yeah. Brandon one had a quick question. Brandon Usher. Yes. Good morning, Justice Lechman. Good day. Where um, are you from? Lechman, sorry. I'm from Belize as well. I'm a talk show host at Channel yeah. 7 uh, Belize. Um, but my question is, as a talk show host, and we're on live television, I heard you say that comments from, from our viewers could also be defamatory. However, Speaking to what Mr. Gibbons just said about censorship, how does one go ahead and try to censor those comments when you don't know what is being said while you're being Well, that's there? the risk you take if you don't have a mechanism whereby you can shut it down. Um, Wesley in, the tele in Trinidad, the Telecommunications Authority. Yeah. Has, um, what's the word yeah. requirements? Yeah, Kiran can, um, can talk more about that. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's a delay system. It's supposed to be a delay system. system. And I have to tell you, not everybody has it. And if they do a a surprise audit and you don't have it, it could be in some hot water. Yeah. So if you want to take that risk, you are running a very big risk. If, as I said, it does slip through, you have to shut it down. You have to divorce yourself from it. For example, once I'll give you an example of something I actually heard on the radio. Topic. Nothing wrong with the topic. Somebody called in and said, um, you know, I, I, I don't know why, why this person is, is fit in office. I don't think he's fit to be in office. Everybody knows that he did such and such and such. And the talk show host immediately said, stop, stop, stop. I'm not permitting that. We are not permitting that. You have to apologize now to Mr. So-and-so. So you have to immediately divorce yourself from that. Otherwise, the claimant can go after you as opposed to the, the individual. Probably once they can identify who it is, they may name that person too in the suit. But you as the media house or the broadcaster or the host, you are easy to find and you are responsible. So it's a risk that you're taking. You have to engage in the DA system. That would be I my see, uh, Devin has a question before I do that. Uh, Devin, oh. this is going to be the last question on this particular um, presentation. We do have other presentations and yeah. uh, time for questions. Um, you know, it's interesting. I just wanted to make this point very quick. I've heard uh, politicians in Parliament said, I'm not calling him a liar. I am not saying that he's a liar um, in the house, which goes on the record. We also have to be very cognizant not to repeat some of the libel and some of the defamation. I'm going to ask Devin to come in here quickly. Yeah, um, it, it just was just um, a follow-up in terms of um, removing um, articles in the sense that um, if you have found that you are wrong, right, and um, you have been asked to remove it, yes. I mean, you will have to remove it. Because yeah. uh, if, if you are found in the wrong that, that you something you wrote was libelous or defamatory, of course you have to remove it from your um website and you probably have to place an apology there too. Okay, so um yeah. quickly, so it, in the sense that, that I'm not wrong, um the person was charged but they won the case. I just don't like um, it or prefer should that I, you don't should I, anything. Should I, start, should I start a new article or use the same article and update it? Um, well, you can do both. If the person okay. is acquitted, if the person is acquitted today, it's a fresh news. You will write the story saying the person is um, acquitted. I would also, in, if the story is remaining, you could put a footnote, an update. Sometimes you have a spend and you have the update saying this person was acquitted and so, 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 so. Okay, thank you. Right. But that's more journalism than strictly law. <laughs> but as I'm saying, once the person is acquitted, you have to publish it. You should publish it with the same prominence as you publish the allegation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Um, just because of time, we have to move on. It's always so good listening to you and your presentation. And you know, you come from that background that really understands how things work in the media, which is also very important. So thank you again. Uh, I'm going to introduce our next presenter this morning. He is no stranger to us, Wesley Gibbons who is an award-winning freelance journalist, newspaper columnist, television presenter, and media trainer. He is based in Trinidad and Tobago, and he's actively involved in, he's active in more than 12 countries and territories in the Caribbean. Wesley Gibbons has been in the media business for close to 40 years and has trained journalists throughout the region and co-authored and authored a number of training manuals for use by Caribbean journalists. He has worked as a Caribbean lecturer at the Caribbean Media, the Caribbean School for Media and Communication, CARIMAC, University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica, and has trained journalists throughout the Caribbean. I, Before I ask Wesley to uh, start his presentation, 
I know that Dr. Justin Ku, who is the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Law at UWE, intellectual property lecturer and author, was expected to join us. Um, I know that he is traveling or he's at the airport at this at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if he will still be able to join us, uh, but if he does, any questions on copyright and copyright issues can be posed to him. Wesley will be looking at journalism of verification. Wesley, uh, please, um, you can commence with your presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nazima. I'm, I'm very good to see you folks. As, as I said in the last encounter we had, Deidre, um, I hope to be able to see everybody in person sooner rather than later. Um, not necessarily only in the Keys, but um, in and around uh, Belmopan and Belize City. Now, the Justice Waterman Lachu is a very, very difficult act to follow. Uh, even though she focuses very heavily on law and matters of, 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 of defamation and laws and its application in journalism, you will find that a lot of what I have to say relates very heavily to some of the things that she has said. Because it's my belief that if quality journalism is practiced, then you have a way of mitigating the impacts of the application of law. Uh, you, you, you are able to erect shields against uh, impositions by people who will want to find uh, fault with the work that you do. So the journalism of verification um, is very much relevant to this. And I think it's, it's a sort of, it's a bedrock of the practice of journalism. So let me get into it. Um, of course, I had the, the report, the presentation up all the time, but it's now disappeared and now I have it. So let's call this a journalism of verification and the fact that in our environment, it's very much a challenge. It's a challenge because uh, we, are, we generally tend to be small countries, uh, small communities, people know each other. And it, the temptation for us to jump to the conclusion that we know is very, the temptation is very, very imminent all the time. And uh, there is a belief um, that um, based on a very superficial knowledge of events and developments that we can conclude that something has been verified. But the process of journalistic verification really sets a standard for the practice of journalism that's not very easy to find regionally. And I come to that conclusion based on looking at, at how we practice our work. So let's spend some time looking at the, this verification challenge we have as Caribbean people. Let's look at the sources of, of the information that we're tending to be deriving some of our material from. Now, all of this is quite separate and distinct from the, our primary sources. So our journalists go out and they're gathering news, they're covering events, and, and therefore they are, they are acquainted, they're in touch with primary sources. But there's an increasingly heavy reliance on secondary sources. So let's have a look at some of these secondary sources. Social media. Now, social media have emerged as very, very widely used uh, points of contact, particularly for, for tips. Hopefully people are not lifting things entirely from social media and employing it as if it is their primary um, source for, for stories. But even if you are using social media posts and social media material as background or as tips or as clues into further features of the stories you're writing, you need to ask some very important questions about the social media accounts from which you are uh, deriving this information. Who do these people claim to be? The people who advocate for freedom of expression are not very strong on, uh, or uh, let me put it another way, are very strong on the notion of anonymity in social media because it, uh, it affords a certain level of protection. And people who are in, in sensitive situations, politically and militarily and so on, may decide to use anonymous or, or pseudonyms or made up names in order to conceal their identity, 
and while even as they're posting very important matters of public interest. You need to be very careful about the bona fides of, this, of the social media sources and to be clear uh, about what you're dealing with. Verified social media accounts ought to, in your mind, carry a heavier weight than those anonymous sources. But even so, and I'm gonna to come to that when you set your benchmarks for verification, you need to be able to attach a certain level of journalistic weight to what is being asserted, what is being claimed, what is being said. Twitter and this situation may change sooner rather than later, or it may never change at all. You need to ensure that for certain categories of information that you're dealing with verified accounts. Um, the process of verification for, uh, for Twitter accounts, for example, um, you, you, you can see it through the little blue mark, uh, the blue tick that appears to the names of people. And there is a certain standard set by Twitter for verified accounts. But even so, not because it's a verified account or it's a prominent personality's uh, private or, or public account, you're going to, you are going to assert the authenticity of it as higher than everybody else's. Because of course, everybody, once you're human, can be wrong about things. There are ways where you can check when an account is created. So sometimes you see an event emerging in your country and the development was yesterday. It's very contentious, usually political in nature, um, sometimes linked to, to high profile people, celebrities and so on. And uh, there was a development yesterday and somebody message is, begins messaging very prolifically about that particular event or development or person. And you check when the account was created and you realize that the account was created yesterday. Now the people who operate um, bots and these are uh, mechanized accounts that are meant to promote particular angles and particular messages on social media um, are able to activate these things very, very quickly and to accumulate uh, very wide coverage in the, on the social media landscape within a very short period of time. So in, in drawing from social media accounts, which I'm saying is something that we can't ignore completely, but we need to be exercising care. You need to be able to, to have a look uh, or to check when the account is created. And then, and I'm sure most of you do this already. If, if you don't, um, let me know. I can't see the chat in, in, um, in the, the mode that I'm in here, but you can put it there. I think that most of us in any case, if you are operating on social media, and whether it's, it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok now and so on, you're able to tell the people who are commenting on your, on your, on your posts or who are trying to send messages to you, you're able to check quite easily who comprises that person's network, social media network, who are their friends, followers, what kinds of conversations they have been engaged in, what are they retweeting, what are they tending to share, what do, what do they like? And then you can extrapolate from that different patterns. You can basically tell where they're coming from. Now bear in mind all along, and there's a separate presentation we can do on this all together, that once you're operating in a social media space, you're operating in a public space. There's very little room for social media schizophrenia, I call it, where you are one thing on one social media account and another person on a social media account. So you are projecting an image of an independent journalist on, on Facebook, but on Twitter, or on Instagram, or on TikTok, or wherever you are in the social media space, you are pro promoting partisan messages. You are saying bad things or negative things about people who are otherwise the subject of your, of your media coverage. The, the social media space does not allow you, does not permit that kind of flexibility. It's an inexcusable because it is a public space and these things will come back to bite you. In some instances, media houses are imposing social media policy guidelines 
uh, that are very rigorously applied to um, their employees, to the journalistic staff in particular, where you're not permitted um, to, to carry on as um, in, in an undignified manner on social media, while at the same time projecting an image of professionalism and objectivity and, and independence as a journalist. So even as you are checking the background of the people that you're following on social media and using as sort of immediate sources of information and views and so on, you need to yourself be careful about your social media presence, the things you're posting, what you are liking, what you are retweeting. People are fond of putting the disclaimer that this is not, this does not represent uh, the views of my organization, but that's very often not a protection. And, and there's not a, I'm not talking about law and legal protection. I'm talking about a protection vis-a-vis -vis your reputation as a professional. It's not a protection to you if you post something that's particularly um, salacious or derogatory when it comes to, to somebody or, or obscene. Um, it's not enough to say, well, um, this is not um, the view of my employers, my media employers. It's not a protection. You are still, you and your media organization will still be subject to, um, to negative commentary and, and a negative perception about, about yourself. Very often we rely on other mainstream media. So other mainstream media might provide us with tips. And the way it used to be, and it's changing now, was that print media would sort of, sort of follow broadcast media. So the broadcast media in there, because you are producing these capsule, caps, encapsulated news reports, very brief, very much to the point that the print media brought, the, the print media would basically take a tip from that and say, ah, look, something has happened. And we're going to follow through on this. We just need to be sure that what we are using as the tip from other mainstream media, which hopefully even as they have, permit, have gone through a process of verification themselves, we have to be ensure that we add another layer of verification on top of that. So we would ask questions about the sources. What were the sources of this story? Is it original content or did they themselves borrow material from other media, sometimes other media outside of the country? So there's a tip, there's a development, there's a breaking story that emerges from another source. And the temptation is to try to get this out as soon as possible. So you go to press or you go on air or you go online and you post it. And even if you, you, uh, there is a citation in terms of the original source, there's no protection either at law or, or, or um, through professional ethics for posting something that was not verified, was not original um, and, 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 and perhaps was entirely incorrect. Was there a high level of verification? So you're looking at this other source, this other media house, might be another media house in your jurisdiction, but you want to use that material as a tip for further elaboration. You need to ensure that the material that you're borrowing, that you're using as a basis for further interrogation was itself verified and, and verified at a very high level. You need to be very clear as well of what are the precise claims being made and why. Because sometimes, and this happens very often in, in the politics, but it happens in other areas of public life, where there is a deliberate attempt to undermine the credibility or, of, of, of people, uh, to undermine their character in a way that would take away the, the validity of what they have to say, not on the same issue for which that's being flagged by a particular episode or, or, or a particular event, but a completely different area. But in the process of undermining that person's credibility, claims are being made on something seemingly unrelated. So it, might, it, it has been noted, for example, 
that in social media, um, that in social media attacks on journalists, um, they may point to things such as the um, sexual behavior, claims of, um, of substance abuse, uh, claims that in some previous um, incarnation, they um, were said to have committed a, an illegal act. And these things are used to undermine the, the, um, the credibility of, of journalists in particular. And you'll find that there are worldwide campaigns that guard against this, particularly when it comes to, to women um, journalists, um, because it's much easier, it has been found, you know, um, in some societies, if there's a claim of infidelity on the part of a man, there are people in your audiences who will be cheering on and say, yeah, boy, he's good. But if a claim of infidelity is, is launched against a female journalist, a woman journalist, uh, there's a different um, kind of, of attitude that's taken on altogether. So we need to be sure about the claims being made and how those claims may relate to things outside of the immediate story. Do these stories that we're extracting from other media build on other developments? And what are those other developments? Then we look at photo, the use of images, because bear in mind that images are dominating the social media sphere. In fact, all mass media sphere, you find that there's a greater attraction and a greater ability to, a greater tendency to, to believe things that you, are, that you are seeing or what you believe you are seeing. But even so, you need to ask questions about those photos and those videos and those other visuals that you're seeing. Who's responsible for it? Who took the photo? You know, if it was a graphic, you know, was it, or were, the, were the elements of the graphics verified? When did it happen? You, of course, know, and all of us, um, I know the, the folks in Sin Kids will know this, you know, you have a, a severe weather event. And suddenly on social media, you see a confluence of uh, uh, the emergence of a whole pile of, of videos, disaster videos in particular. And when you check it, they're coming from other countries and happened a long time ago. There are ways you can verify that. And at the end, I'm going to give you some tips. When did the event take place? Do the weather conditions match in the event of a severe weather event? Um, what are the... What are the clothes people are wearing? You can get tips about the authenticity of, of photographs and video in particular when you, you have a look at what they are, the clothes people are wearing, the language, the accent. Not too long ago, there was a, a claim of a military intervention into Guyana by uh, Venezuelan um, military force, uh, air forces. And the people who were supposedly looking on, looking at the air, up at the air from the, from the ground, um, they were all speaking Spanish and true on the border territories in Guyana. And of course, in Belize, there are Spanish people who speak Spanish, there are people who speak Portuguese. And um, it ought to raise a red flag that the people looking up at the aircraft flying overhead, ostensibly on Guyana, in Guyana territory, airspace, um, they were all speaking Spanish. And the, um, the clothes they were matching with, or to, were wearing did not um, match very conveniently with what you would expect people in a border town um, to be wearing. Um, license plates. We have in instances where in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, we had some severe flooding events. And flooding events from other parts of the world were, were, were on display. And in a few instances, there were vehicles involved vehicles cascading down mountain sides, washed away by floods. But if you had a close look at it, you look at the license plates and you see that they weren't license plates from Trinidad and Tobago. Any questions before I move on to the next slide? Because I'm moving really fast. Uh, right, thanks Nazima. So, the process. So, so now we've had a, a kind of look at some of the things that, or that ought to raise red flags or to, to, to have questions circulating in the newsroom. And I like newsrooms that are interactive. I remember when I first got into journalism, um, 
you know, 40 years ago, um, there were people in, a, in our newsroom, including um, Justice Waterman Lachu herself, and you find that it, you, you were able, you found a high level of questioning of material when you're able to share it with colleagues in a, in a newsroom. And what I have found in, 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 in modern newsrooms that tend to be a bit smaller now is that you don't have this interaction. So people and people asking and challenging and asking questions, boy, you're sure? Because that is all verification really is, you know, asking yourself, are you sure? And then as an automatic follow from that is that what enables you to be sure? We could get into a whole philosophical discussion about the distinction between truth and fact, but we'll have to have a, an entire different sec, uh, session on that. But we need as professionals to set our benchmarks for verification, both at the level of the media enterprise and as individual journalists. Now, what do I mean by benchmarks for verification? There are media enterprises outside of the Caribbean that I'm aware of where their benchmark for verification is a minimum of three independent sources. So unless you're able to have independent verification, particularly of a contentious issue, to which you were not a primary contact, you are not the one who was there. You are not the one who was there. So you are not a primary contact or, or you would have, as a journalist, see it yourself you need to have in your mind a benchmark for verification. How many independent sources? How many of us have covered road traffic accidents? Let me know. Nobody? Don't tell me nobody here has covered a, a traffic accident. Hmm. Seems like nobody covered a, a, a road traffic accident. But have you been in a road traffic accident? Most of us have. I covered one two days ago. Right. What about being in any? <laughs> have you? No, no, I haven't. No. Have you been in an accident? Well, let us say that some other event. You've been um, an assault or a murder or something, and you arrive on the scene. You're there with your camera and your notebook and so on, and you're there and you're talking to people. Particularly road traffic accidents. Let's take something else a little less serious. How many versions of the story do you get? If you speak to three different people, how many versions of, of the, the crash? Who saw that the light was red? Who saw that the light was green? Have you noticed that you tend to get different versions of what happened, depending on that the P word, depending, depending on perspective or the vantage point? And it's the same principle that would apply in all other areas of our coverage, that depending on the vantage point or the, put, the, the, the personal perspective of the person you are interviewing or, or whose views you are taking on board, you're going to get a different view. You're going to get a different angle. And it, this is what adds to the story and adds to the, the value of the story when you're able to present the various perspectives, the other side of the story or the other sides of the story. We are fond of saying the other side of the coin, but a coin, even a coin doesn't have just two sides. It has that bit around the, um, around it. Uh, there are different perspectives. So it's, it's the other sides of the story, the other perspectives of the story. And your journalism needs to embrace that. That usually, whatever the event, it might be a mundane event, a fender bender around the corner, two cars, one person knocking into the other one, and the driver of the one, the, the, the one who's driving the car in front tells you one side of the story, the one who's behind tells you, well, they, they stop suddenly, and so on. And the person was standing on the sidewalk, and the person on the sidewalk is giving you a different perspective. So your journalism is going to be better if you set your personal benchmarks for verification 
And of course, I'm a strong believer in the media enterprises themselves setting some official benchmarks for their journalists uh, so that such that when a story reaches the editor's desk, the editor is fully within his or her right to send you back to the drawing board to say, well, look, a single source story does not add up. I'm seeing a, it as a current event right now in Trinidad and Tobago, where based on a, an event a long time ago, um, okay, there's a question about faith based. I'm coming to that. Um, the, 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 and and it was, this, this is something that happened years ago, uh, 1996 or 7, 97, somewhere around there. And a particular media house carried a story. It was a single source story for, as far as I'm concerned. And that story is being considered as a sort of um, a verified source for food and elaboration by um, journalists nowadays. And I have strong questions to ask about that because it goes back to my initial slide where I talk about from, from whom are we de deriving these different streams of information that are going to form the, the basis for our stories. So that's one thing. Let's set a benchmark for verification. Let's also don't add or extrapolate. Now, journalists tend to be pretty clever people, I would like to think. Uh, <laughs> Because of the exposure, we have to a wide variety of events and, and developments and issues and we're there in the parliament or whatever. They, we, we tend to have a very high estimation of our value and our analytical skills and our, able, our ability to put two and two together and get four, sometimes five. This relates to the last point I'm talking about, which is the humility, but the humility feeds into a, a, a level of deception that can come that can sometimes seep into our, our reportage because we are extrapolating. We are saying, look, if this plus this has occurred, then the outcome can only be this. And we're extrapolating and we're coming to conclusions on the basis of what we believe is our higher understanding or greater understanding of what's happening. And we have to be cautious about that. I don't know what people think about this, but I always tell newcomers to the journalism field that in a public uh, debate or discussion on, on a live issue, the least important opinion as a journalist on the issue is yours. And I think if we take that predisposition to, to the questions that are being raised publicly, I think that if the better we, the closer we will come to producing verified information, information that can stand the test of, of very strong questioning. So we do not set about to deceive. So there might be a particular um, predisposition or, or like or dislike or belief or disbelief. And here is where perhaps uh, the question about the faith-based faith -based organizations uh, will come into question. Uh, there might be a predisposition based, based on, on, on belief systems that we need to be aware of. I have, a, I have an entire slide on that, which I can't um, think I'm always warned by moderators about going over my time, but I will go over my time if I spend um, more time on, on that particular point. So we don't, don't deceive, don't, uh, don't uh, try to appear to be um, clever, simply state what you know to be provably true, provably true. And that, if we wanted to, we could take that to the, um, the question of truth versus fact. And Justice Waterman Latchu can um, hint at it, but there is, even at law, there is a distinction. There, is a, there are distinction between these levels of understanding that we need to be clear about. What we are concerned about as journalists is what is provably true and what are the facts. But of course, there's, there's a high philosophy question involved here. You need to be transparent as well. So if the editor or somebody who's looking at your work wants to know 
about the methodology employed to arrive at the conclusion of your story, you ought to be able to explain this very clearly and very methodically. You ought to be able, with, with, with some exceptions, of course, to be able to establish the bona fides of your sources. Now, confidentiality of sources is a very important feature of what we do. But a single anonymous source ought to be considered among the weaker, along the spectrum of, of, of believability, of authenticity. The, the anonymous source is very low down that food chain, very, very low down. You, you see entire stories written on the basis of a first person account from an anonymous source. And you know how it goes. You do the interview and the person tells you, look, all of this is off the door, all of this is on background. I just tell you this, but, and there are very strong assertions in there. And then you run to press on the basis of um, your confidence in that anonymous source. There's a question from the Deidre side. Yes, go ahead, guys, if you have questions, it might be turned on. OK. The other thing is originality. Because as um, the justice said, um, it's not good enough for you to say, I am protected because somebody else said it. Some other media. So how come another media else said it and, and, and you didn't tell them anything? No, you have to accept responsibility for what you publish and what you put out there. And plagiarism has seeped into, the, into this, and I know Dennis is going to come to this in terms of the, the ethics. Uh, plagiarism has become a feature, particularly with, with most media being online now, has become a, a recurring feature and a disturbing one at that, where there's outright plagiarism, many times without attribution of other people's material. So origin, you have to strive for originality. And I made the point about humility um, before. Any questions before I move on? So I do have one, um, actually two. The other one part across from the, the previous presentation. If we could just take people's posts, public posts on social media and use those as part of our reporting, you, well, you have to be able to authenticate that it is them, that these are the, that, that is what they said, and not somebody with a, with a clone account. You have a lot of difficulty. It's, it's highly problematic, highly problematic. I think that if you're able to make independent contact with a person, I think that you should do that in order to verify that what they have posted on, online is, is what act, actually what they posted. because. Sometimes you would call them and they would say, but what are, you, what are you talking about? And there's a cloned account, or there is somebody else who used their account, and you end up in trouble because of that. So yes, it can be a source, but it, it's usually a tip. That's just a tip. It, it's not the story for sure. It's not the story. If you're able to verify that, um, that a public personality or, or somebody, anybody else, has gone on Facebook and, and boasted about killing somebody or to committing some grievous act. Um, you know, you have to be careful, very, very careful about how you how you do that. But so you, you don't just run off and say, okay, so and so said based on what you see as a Facebook um, post or, 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 or a tweet or something like that. Okay. Ask, sorry. The other question was based on the example of Justice Bachu earlier, and uh, it was specifically relating to putting an allegation to someone in an interview, their response saying that it is unfounded, and you still report what the allegation is plus that response. What else are you supposed to do? I mean, of course, there is follow up. Um, you can do a request documentation and so to prove what is being stated, but if she could expand or if you could comment on that as well. Okay, I'm going to ask Justice to come in on this question, but before that, I want to cite an example of what you're talking about here. A reporter here in Trinidad and Tobago 
once asked a politician, a government minister, when was the last time you beat your wife? <laughs> yeah. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Katya, you will still come in. Yes. That's why I said it's an area that could be a little tricky. I just wanted to raise the red flag to be alert. A lot depends on the circumstances, on the context. If, for example, something is said in Parliament, you know, in Parliament, people have protection and a lot of allegations can be, can be made. So if something blows up in Parliament, and afterwards, the subject of the allegation, you decide to seek out the subject of the allegation. Say outside of parliament, no, you don't have the coverage of parliament. And the person might be very willing because they might think, I didn't, I don't feel as if I got a full opportunity to defend myself. At the time, I'm glad for this opportunity to further defend myself. So in those circumstances, the person will, will might be very happy to say, look, I'm really glad for this opportunity to, to ventilate this and put it to rest and so, 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 so. So there you might have the person's cooperation. So the repeating of the allegation in that context may be all well and good. But let us say it is a circumstance, as I said, where you stick a microphone in somebody's face <laughs> as they come out of church or picking up their newspaper. You're about to, to, to go to publication and you are, um, it was said, there's an allegation, so, so, so it was said, so what do you have to say? And the person blurts out something or says no comment. And you say, well, I tried to get the comment, you know, I, I got the, I tried to get the comment. Or the person said it's absolute nonsense. And you, that is not necessarily going to protect you because they don't have the protection of parliament. They don't have the protection of it being said in court. And the allegation may not have even come from a credible source. That's, that's really the mischief there. If it is something that is just blowing up on social media and people, as I said, the example I gave, it, it's, it's water cooler gossip. For years, there have been all sorts of allegations that have never been, never died down. And every so often they resurface about certain public figures, no proof. That is more the scenario that I'm cautioning you about. What you should do, yes, social media is blowing up about it, yet people might be gossiping at um, particular election time. Yeah, when things get very um, fiery and loosey-goosey, people say all sorts of things. Yes, it might be blowing up, but your job, I would think, is to seek to verify it. It is not always sufficient just to say, I'm publishing this and it's okay because I got somebody else, I got the reply. Verify it, see if you could investigate it first. And as part of your investigation, as part of the verification process, you seek comment from the subject of the allegation. They might have a document that might assist you, that might clear up something unanswered, that might even put the allegation to rest. So the source of, of, the, of, the, of the allegation in and of itself will tell you what direction to go. What I was really cautioning you about is don't think that an unfounded allegation from some anonymous source or unreliable source suddenly puts on new clothes because you get a comment from the subject of the allegation. And so that's, for that. Yeah, that, that's how I was trying to, to explain it. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Andre, you have a question? Yeah, on the same subject. Good morning, everyone. Um, the, oh, good afternoon, sorry. The, um, there, there, there is an incident, and as you talk about, you use the example of the journalist asking the parliamentarian if he beat his, when last he beat his wife. There is an actual situation that happened in Jamaica just maybe about a year or two ago, where, long story short, the health minister, um, there, there was a story that was published or was being investigated in connection with the health minister um, having an arrangement, or the health ministry having an arrangement with a company that the woman is alleged to have an affair with the minister. And so the journalist asked the question quite bluntly, did you cheat on your wife? In addition, you know, to try to you know, put the story in context. Um, and of course the minister responded um, by telling her it's none of our business and um, did not answer the question basically. In, in, a question like, in a situation like that, was the question considering the context of the story, was the question appropriate or was it a case where 
the journalist was just being. <laughs> now you're seeing some of us giggling because we know exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's a big situation that um, I experienced. In 1998, our government general elections, the then ruling party had made their slogan, it's all about trust. And they kept insinuating about the new opposition leader's fidelity issues in his marriage. And, and they were using that to kind of undercut his integrity and the ability to trust him as a new leader. And I remember they had these series of parades. His party was very strong. And in one of the parades on Barrack Road, I remember no less, I asked him. And it is well known that he has two families. So I asked him, I said, listen, the ruling party is making it all about your integrity. Their slogan is, it's about trust. They're pitting you against the current prime minister and what he's considered to be virtuous. Um, and your family situation of having two families uh, with two different women. And he said to me, I don't wear my heart on my sleeves. When it's time for me to answer to my maker, I will answer for that. So that's what I thought with that question. And I had nowhere else to take it. I just used the answer. That was where. Okay. Now, I don't address the, the, those particular cases. Um, it, it, but I think the, I want to address the principle. I think it's very, it, it's a problematic thing when you talk about it is well known, um, because the, the proof pr proof goes beyond it is well known or what people talk about or what people speculate about or or, or what's in the public domain as a kind of um, popular fact. Um, because again, we enter this this domain of what is provably true. Right, as opposed to what's what's out there in the marketplace. Um, I know at law there, there are different sta there are standards that, that that are very explicit on these kinds of questions. But on the journalistic side, I would be very very cautious about some of about some of these assertions, and 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 what you're aiming for is what is provably true. What you can what you can verify through more than one source to be true. You know, a politician walking out of more than one instance in the UK, you've had photographs of, of politicians walking out of um, brothels and places of ill repute and simply carrying the picture in some instances <laughs> has led to the to resignations and calls for resignation and so on, because what are you doing in that place? But you you could not take the additional step to say that the politician was in a brothel consorting with a prostitute or, or spending time in a bed um, with a prostitute. I'm just putting that as general guidance, but those very specific cases, I think that that calls for a level of judgment within the newsroom in terms of how you would um, how you would um, would carry the story. I, I have a predisposition against about erring on the side of caution when it comes to these things, particularly if they engage, they involve people's uh, reputations. Um, I don't know if Katyana has a has a perspective on that. Yes, I support what you are saying, Wesley, and a lot has to do with the local context and the particular circumstances of the article. For example, the example that was given, it seems to me from the comment, the person seemed to be admitting it, or at least not disputed it. <laughs> yes. yes. But a lot depends on the local circumstances. For example, in another location, the United States, for example, every political candidate seems to be the subject of intense uh, spotlighting about their, 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 their associations, their romantic associations, whether they have a girlfriend, whether they cheated on their wife. I remember Ross Perot was a presidential candidate and I remember he, one of his famous lines was that uh, he wouldn't want a man in his in his circle who um, had affairs because he said if his wife can't trust him why should I? <laughs> <laughs> yes so in the United States that seems to be a big thing there's always some report 
or allegation of somebody having affairs or not having affairs. Or, or that seems to be part of that landscape. The Caribbean con, I'm not saying, I'm not into morality uh, here. I'm not saying right on. The Caribbean context seems to have a different view of those things. But I agree with Wesley, be very careful about these open secrets. Yeah, try to verify, try to verify. It's not a topic itself that there's nothing off, off yes. base. There's nothing off, um, out of bounds. Yeah. You know, this is one of itself out of bounds, but verification yeah. is very important. It's a matter, as you say, it's a, matter, it's a decision for the newsroom for policy, news judgment, and ethics as to whether you think it's newsworthy or not. Now, of course, I'm just drawing a scenario. This is not any real life scenario. If somebody, let us say a public figure, has a platform, a family life, the integrity of family, li family life, yes? They are a lay preacher in their church and they give sermons and so on about, you know, the sanctity of family life. So what you're really aiming at is hypocrisy, not the morality. You're not setting yourself up as the moral minority, yeah? It's not immoral, yeah. but the hypocrisy. So the point I'm making is a question of news judgment and of verification. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, uh, recently we've had that issue as it relates to domestic violence and gender-based violence. Um, I think in the in the last year and, and change, there is one very prominent politician who has been accused at least twice of uh, 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 assaulting women or, 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 or getting into a position to assault women, and he's had to give up his position over it. Actually, went to court, but he hasn't been charged. He hasn't been, or rather, he was charged, but had uh, the charges dropped. But um, as a follow from that, there have been other prominent politicians in his party that have either been accused of similar incidents or being the victim of similar incidents and then from the other side as well. Uh, and, and so we, we've had a, a, a difficult time trying to juggle all of that in terms of public interest and, uh, uh, and as you said, the whole issue of morality and, and, and hypocrisy. Yeah, exactly. And, and you see, that, that's why we, what we're aiming for is what is, is, is a focus on what is the substantive issue. So if there's an award of a contract, for example, um, and and there, there, there is this perpetual um, focus on a, pers a personal relationship that led to the award of a contract that was not that did not go out for public tender. What you see, what is happening in the public mind is that the focus is 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 on um, the, the the supposed immoral behavior of a politician, as opposed to the substantive issue of the unlawful, perhaps, or the unethical at least, behavior in the award of a contract. Um, so we need to keep our eye on, on these issues. And as uh, Justice Latchew said, the, 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 we are not a, the morality police, and we are not yet on, on questions of morality. You're there in terms of addressing issues of fact and issues that don't have a direct bearing on the well-being of our societies. Now, I've been given a time check, so maybe we could come back to some of these issues because I know when Dennis makes, makes his presentation, some of these things will emerge as well. Just a reminder about Kevin's question also in the chat. Which is, sorry. Can faith-based media houses whose content? <laughs> my son is um, competing yesterday, and yeah. my apologies. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I, um, and you see that has to do, there, there ought to be policy on this, but, for, at a personal level, you know, um, I do not add any particular weight, additional weight. I don't put any additional weight on the um, pronouncements of, of um, faith-based institutions and even their major spokespersons. I treat them as human beings and um, that's the weight that I attach to it. At a personal level, we may or may not proceed in that way, but that would be my, my admonition, that there's no additional weight to be attached to someone on the basis of religious belief or their status within their religious organization. That's my, um, that's how I approach that particular question. Uh, Nazima has given me a tight time check here, so let me try to um, not get her angry. So this period of the pandemic has brought this whole thing of verification clearly into view because 
what we are now more exposed to this notion of disinformation, separate and distinct from misinformation, because misinformation can become disinformation. The difference essentially is in what, what is the motivation for disseminating information. Here we are talking about sources of disinformation and back in 2020, towards the end of 2020, early 2021, ICFJ um, and others did a, conducted a survey, and this is um, US-based basically, um, trying to find out where were people getting most of their disinformation and misinformation from on the pandemic uh, in terms of the sources of, 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 of information. And this, this related both to um, this related both to issues of the pandemic itself, because at one point early in the pandemic, we were addressing issues of COVID denial. People basically saying, oh, this is not real, this is a pandemic and all that rubbish. And then we entered the phase of disinformation relative to the vaccines. So and it contributed very heavily to, um, to, to vaccine hesitancy. Um, in, in a lot of jurisdictions, and it's particularly in the Caribbean, we find that we are having very low rates of very low vaccination rates based essentially on, on disinformation related to the efficacy of the, the vaccines, the possible impacts, and so on. So who are the sources of this disinformation? Who are the people whose views we were reflecting uh, are not cross-matching them against um, what was authoritatively pronounced on by the people who know these things, the researchers, the real researchers, not the people who go on Google and and, and play. Well, what it was, what they found was a vast, the, the biggest slice of this information were coming from regular everyday citizens. Regular average everyday citizens, Auntie Jane, neighbor Joe, your colleague in the newsroom, relative of yours, very close friend of yours, most of it, regular citizens. You'll also find a very high level of it from politicians, even the elected, some elected official, but largely from people from the political sphere. And we had the, um, we had the experience over um, between 2020 and 2021 of having several changes in government. I know in, um, that was the case in Belize, but I'm not saying that this is what happened in Belize, but the, you find that there has been a sharpening or a change in perspective on the pandemic um, between when politicians were in opposition, where basically many of them, not all, were saying that the thing was overkill, the pandemic measures were destroying the country, they were negative, and we need to, to um, ignore some of the admonitions coming from the WHO and others. And when it shifted to governance and, and them being in charge, the message started changing. So you find that during the course of the pandemic, a lot of misinformation, disinformation, misleading information were coming from politicians. Then you have the, the busybodies, the attention treating trolls, seeking trolls that we call them in the social media sphere. You know, the busybodies on social media, you know, they, 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 pronounce, they have a pronouncement they have an opinion on every single thing. Um, some of them, I know in some countries, they, they are being put in the, the, the category of social media influencers. And some of these social media influencers are now coming into the mainstream through politicians. Um, because you're getting a level of recognition on the part of politicians, even politicians in power. Uh, providing platforms, ready platforms and authenticity and validation for people who, people who are nothing more than attention seeking trolls on social media. Many of them describing themselves as journalists or describing what they're doing as journalistic in nature. Nazima is gonna cut me off just now. So you can, you, the list is before you there and you can see um, some of the sources that were cited as contributory in terms of disinformation during um, the, the early and mid um, phases of the, of the pandemic. I know that there are studies undergo, undergoing right now. In, in the Caribbean, we don't need to do enough of this. The Media Institute of the Caribbean has done some work on this in terms of its influence on, um, on, on the media industry and so on. 
Nazima, give me three more minutes. Okay, so you see th that's a chart there. You, you, can, um, you can look this up if you want to interrogate it a little bit. Now where, so where are these, where, are, where were people finding this information that fed into the diagram I showed you before? Where auntie, neighbor Joe, your partner from the rum shop, where basically in terms of social media was most of this material being conveyed? Now this would differ from country to country um, because I know that in some countries, Twitter is more important um, and is more significant as a, a, a purveyor of, of news and information than other countries. Facebook seems to be a common denominator throughout the Caribbean. So you can look at the contribution of Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, WhatsApp with, which began basically as an interpersonal communication tool, like a telephone, but has now be entered the sphere of social media because of the reach, the fact that social media groups and people are forwarding um, material. So WhatsApp has become very, very important, YouTube, Instagram, and so on. And you will know in your individual territories, um, which are the social media platforms people are paying most attention to and how that material is, inter is interfacing with public opinion and even official policy. Uh, you, may, you may know the other day that um, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago was actually lured into a, 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 a WhatsApp scam. I don't know if how many of you would have read that regarding a, a, a purported contribution from Bill Gates, from the Bill Gates Foundation to support um, to support the economy and so on. It turned out to be a, a gigantic scam. It was very embarrassing for the prime minister here. And I would dare say for Trinidad and Tobago that the prime minister of our country would be taken in by um, a, a, a scam. And, and something he even pronounced on at a press conference. He made this big announcement for oh, the Bill Gates Foundation is donating money to Trinidad and Tobago. X, Y, or Z, and it, it turned out to be a scam. Very, very embarrassing. Our Prime Minister, too, as the president of CARICOM. Yes, in fact. Even yeah. pulled in the UN agency in that, in, that, in that issue as well. Yeah, in fact, the very first tip of that from the Prime Minister, Trinidad, who came from the Prime Minister of Belize. Um, so it goes to show, you know, how powerful you know, once played right, if people are interested in, in spreading this information, how powerful these platforms can be that we otherwise take as very a part of our everyday lives. We exchange pleasantries, we touch bases with people. I'm just gonna skip this, but so I said Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and, and, and WhatsApp, which has emerged as highly problematic. What is the modus operandi of people who are interested in spreading this information? How do they operate? How do they make their things seem credible? They build on truth. So very often you see they, they, they build their misinformation on a truth, uh, something that's actually happening. They target emotion. So they have a very good understanding of what people feel about things, what's motivating people, what's making people concerned. They appeal to existing beliefs and bias. So if uh, there's a heavy um, faith-based sort of environment in which you operate, you'll probably find that they would link it to a religious belief. Um, they might be able to, they might be quoting um, from scripture once from one source or the other to support the contention. And so they're appealing to, to a belief system or to a particular bias. Um, they exploit networks. So WhatsApp is very effective because most of our family, family networks, our community networks, our neighborhood groups and so on, operate on WhatsApp and they use this magic um, key of, of the visual, of visual media. So you find that if it's accompanied by, by, by visuals, it's more powerful. And there is this bigger, very, this massive question, which I'm going to end on, which is that during this time of the pandemic in particular, and war, and the, the COVID-19 pandemic, monkey flu, all is there is a general sense. The, 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 those people involved in social psychology talk about the atmosphere of pervasive negative ambigu ambiguity. A lot of things we don't know about, or we don't fully understand, but that have negative implications for our society. So more and more people are searching for understanding 
and they're seeking out this understanding from all different sources of, of news and information, many of which are not reliable and which we as journalists need to become involved in, um, in, in, in terms of providing news and information that's verified and that's validated. And before I hand over to Nazima, I want to welcome Dr. Justin Ku, who is joining us. I know he's traveling and he's probably in a, an airport um, long somewhere now. And he is here in the event um, later on if you have any questions about IP and copyright and the practice of journalism. So thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Wesley. Um, is your presentation going to be made available? Yes, I see that your son is available on camera. Yes. Hi, Ray. Sorry about it. <laughs> yes. That happens okay, yes, it will be available. All right. Um, I know that you answered a few questions. Do you have a minute or so for uh, another question or two? Of course. Any other questions for Wesley? If not, we're going to move into Dennis's presentation. Dennis Chabral is a veteran journalist and broadcaster and founder and editor at Demerara Waves and News Talk Radio here in Guyana. He is an executive member of the Association of Caribbean Media Workers and is a past president of the Guyana Press Association. Dennis has been a media practitioner all of his working life, having entered radio on a work study attachment at the now defunct Guyana Broadcasting Corporation in 1984. I was about one year old or so. I now welcome Dennis uh, to give his presentation on ethical journalism. Dennis. Thank you, Nuzima. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, one thing Nuzima is not telling you is that although she was one year old when I entered the media, we ended up attending the same secondary school. So I'd like to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation to you. A special good day, rather good afternoon to our colleagues uh, in, uh, in Belize and other parts of the Caribbean. Um, I'd like to start off today's presentation in ethics with something that Wesley said uh, a while ago. Uh, the least opinion that matters is yours. And I've actually put that in inverted commas and I have attributed to him Wesley Gibbings, 1.05 p.m. the 28th of May, 2022. The reason I'm say, starting off with that is I think that in some measure, it, it really strikes at what I see happening uh, today and what we all are seeing happening here today. I'm just saying this as a matter of brief introduction. We are trying to become the news, apart from our positions on an annual basis or whenever it is necessary, as, uh, as media workers, whenever we are harassed or World Press Freedom Day or, or anything of that nature. Uh, our opinion does not, does not matter. We are not the news makers. In, with specific reference, I see a growing trend uh, which goes to the heart of our ethical behavior. Um, and that, is, that trend is we are all turning up at various places, taking pictures with artists, with politicians, with other prominent personnel, and we're posting them on our social media pages. We may say, okay, well, it's my page, it's my uh, Twitter account, it's, it's my Instagram account. But at the end of the day, we all have an audience to serve in the public's interest. And therefore we should remove any perception as far as possible about what our preferences are. Um, so that in itself, in my estimation, is a no-no when it comes to uh, creating perceptions about ourselves uh, and what implications that may have uh, for our own well-being as journalists. But I go on to that a little more, I'll come back to it actually. So what are you expected to do? And how are you expected to behave in service of the public are key determinants as part of our ethical considerations. Um, your own persona determines who you are and what you do. What we in uh, many parts of the Caribbean like to talk about is our home training. Uh, do, we, do we have proper manners? Do we have etiquette? How are we socialized? 
how are we oriented into the media? Did we have a bad spell where we see people uh, sacrificing the, the basic tenets of their profession and did not find it necessary to embark on our own journey to ascertain what are the rights and wrongs of our profession? All of these things determine who we are and what we would like to do and what we're doing. Did you take a bribe ever, even when you were not in journalism? Did you receive a bribe? Did you give a bribe? Did you take gifts or cash or other forms of consideration for publication or non-publication of material? In school, were you a copycat? Or did you cheat at exams? Or do you peddle gossip? Even now, although you're in the field, all of these things help to shape our old behaviors and how we may view our profession uh, in, in one way or the other. So we've got to be very cognizant about those things. And as much as they may seem to be very insignificant, they have an entire bearing on how we as an individual um, eventually uh, perform and possibly grow in the profession. We have to separate news from opinion. Wesley talked a moment ago about the emergence of um, of these social media influencers. Uh, that in itself, you know, leads to very opinionated uh, positions which are separate and apart from our journalistic news coverage. That is not to say publications will, ha will not have their editorials or their front page commentaries, or in the case of broadcast, a commentary, which, re which represents the position of a particular media house. But for every journalist to go out there and having an opinion on something and making that opinion known and mixing it up with news, that is not what it's supposed to be. And these can lead to all sorts of uh, problems, uh, not only the general performance of your duties, but in the uh, perception of your media house, in your own people, how people perceive you. It can also lead to instances of libel and defamation depending on what you say uh, it, because they may be your opinions um, and you may be saying things that uh, may defame or libel certain people. So you've got to always strike that separation between news and opinion. Always respect the regulations and the laws and of course uh, be wary of all sorts of sanctions whether direct or indirect sanctions. We are not asking you to be engaged in self-censorship. What we're asking you is to be cognizant of the laws and the regulations that can impinge on your performance, namely the Defamation Act. Uh, in the case of Guyana, which I can speak a bit more, uh, we have other laws that also prescribe how we perform our functions. Uh, we're talking here in the case of Guyana, the Racial Hostility Act, uh, the the Sexual Offenses Act, and uh, I think there, was, there is one other law that has to do with the coverage of children in, in, in particular. Uh, respecting other people's privacy. I know in many of the jurisdictions, there may, may be no laws uh, governing privacy, but we, from an ethical perspective, have got to be mindful about how we uh, deal with matters of privacy and confidentiality. Also, respect certain categories of persons, including migrants, uh, people's sexual orientation, the women, the children, and the disabled. And all of these are contained, the various rules, if you will, are contained in the codes of ethics, um, in various newsrooms. They're also contained in laws in a number of jurisdictions, because as, I, as we always say at the level of the ACM, our position is the less laws there are, the better, but we advocate self-regulation. And we also say if these find themselves into the law, then we are obliged to, um, to obey them, but at the same time, resist where necessary. A number of these things find themselves into laws because media houses fail to self-regulate. They fail to act on moral suasion. And of course, a number of the countries are now governed by international uh, conventions uh, that govern certain types of, of actions and behaviors. And therefore, individual jurisdictions have to take the necessary 
uh, steps to enshrine some of these things into law. Uh, be fair and accurate. I think this has been said in so many different words this morning, both by our honor as well as uh, Wesley. So strive for fairness and accuracy. Respect the confidentiality and protection of sources. Uh, whenever people ask you to reveal your sources, uh, be polite and ask them. Had you told me something in the confidence, would you have expected me to tell anyone else? And that is what I tell them. And they shut down right away because they realize that if the shoe was in the other foot, they would not like their name to be your names to be called if they had provided the confidential information. So why ask a journalist who told you this or that? No matter how you and the person are good friends, why should you be revealing your sources? And going back to my earlier comment about endorsements and taking pictures with politicians and other people, these have serious implications, not only for the credibility or perceived credibility of your reports, but also for your very own safety. The safety of journalists is something that we have got to recognize uh, is relevant at various levels in all parts of the world. So safety for us in the Caribbean may not necessarily be, uh, be the same thing for safety um, in, in the larger scheme of things for the journalists in Pakistan or those in Ukraine or in Russia, but we have got ultimately to be careful about our own safety and the perception of our, that may be attached to us directly and our media houses. So again, be wary of those endorsements on Facebook, even taking pictures with, with people who are, whether you're politicians or not. Brand name clothing, uh, not brand name clothing, branded clothing. I'm talking here about uh, sponsorship material, whether it be a cup, a jersey, a bag, uh, be careful with those. You're not endorsing any particular brand, even though the sponsor may be aligned with your media house. So uh, we have got to be uh, very cognizant of what this can mean in the, in the, in the eyes of the average public. We, don't, we should never, ever underestimate the level of perception by the ordinary man in the street. They know when our coverage is swinging left or right, or whether it is fair and balanced. They tell you this, even if it's the man at the, at the betting shop or the person who is having a beer or playing cards uh, in one of the streets in our various cities or villages, they know when we are pulling punches, so to speak, when we are not doing what we're supposed to be, when we are not fair and balanced, when we're perceived in a certain way. So be mindful about that. Also, Make full disclosure uh, in referring to people's association or linkages in your articles. It may be in your in, in, in introducing one of your your inserts or actualities, or at the end of the of a direct quote in a report, you may wish to say, John, for, for example, if let us say that the person who you're quoting is an economist. Uh, but he's also a member of an organization such as a political party. And this is a real life ex example in the view. Uh, it, distinguished economics professor Clive Thomas, who is also an executive member of the Working People's Alliance political party. So people who are reading would already, would already know in full disclosure that this person here may be considered a distinguished economist, indeed he is, but then he also um, has a political hat, which may or may not color what he or she has, what he has said, what he the professor has said. So full disclosure is necessary, and we ought to say so in our, in our various news articles and, and other types of productions. Do not deliberately omit information because you do not like what the person says, or you do not like the person or something like that. The person who you may not like or prefer to omit maybe the person with a valuable perspective that ought to be shared with the public. At the end of the day, you're not writing an article to please yourself. You're writing an article to serve the public's interest. 
And you also have to be uh, wary of using uh, pictures of children. I think Her Honor referred to, um, you know, naming people within a closed group, such as, um, as lawyers who may be in a very closed group, ministers of the government. Um, so I would take that a step further. Be careful with the pictures you use. You do not want to say, for instance, take a picture about uh, what members of the police force uh, and say, well, the, the policemen are engaged in criminal activity, they're selling guns or they're taking bribes. Any one of those policemen or women in that picture may have some justifiable reason for challenging your article in a court of law because you might be indirectly linking uh, that person or that that policeman or policewoman to the whole allegation of taking bribes. So be careful about the videos and stills that you use and what this can mean. Uh, also be always mindful of people who are uh, associated with disasters or accidents, whether they are victims or their relatives and friends of those who um, have been either killed or are seriously injured. We all, you know, rush down to get the news. We rush to the village, we rush to the hospital, and we want to get the information from the horse's mouth, so to speak. We want to ensure that there is a true reflection of what uh, is has happened from the, the persons who are connected to those who may have been directly affected. But at the same time, we have got to be mindful of the state of mind of those people. You know, what if it's somebody's uh, best friend or a mother or a child or any other person who might be considered close, a workmate? Are we rushing in there totally unmindful of the pain and the grief and the distress of those persons? So you've got to approach such situations uh, delicately. Um, coming back to the whole question of accuracy, uh, we have got to be very careful about the sharing of information, not because it's your colleague who covered a story that you want to take as a her story or even ask for the story, and you will decide that you will sit down there and twist it around and rewrite it and pass it off as yours. How can you vouch for the accuracy and the authenticity of that information that was given to you by your friend or colleague. That's the big question. Who will stand the legal bills if you were to be sued? You know, who? how do you tell your editor, any right-thinking editor, if he or she raises a point or a question, how can you defend that to your editor? So these are all things that you've got to be very wary about in, in terms of uh, your ethical practice. Also, be wary of those who offer you uh, what I like to call um, inducements. It's a, probably a fancy word for, for a bribe, but don't take any inducements from people. There are situations where lawyers uh, and their clients offer people in the media uh, inducements to omit certain aspects of a story. Now, I cannot see how that practice can be defended at all. And any right-minded or right-thinking lawyer will never encourage such an activity. Similarly, uh, this has been happening in the area of sports coverage, uh, where people just uh, you know, use the opportunity of giving a reporter a, a free ticket or some of, of promotional material. So you feel obliged, uh, especially to cover a particular event or not to cover a particular event or an issue. Uh, so be, be wary of all of these things that really amount to one thing, conflict of interest. Do not find yourself into a situation of conflict of interests. And as I said earlier, become familiar with the various laws that have a bearing on the media at large and in particular journalism. What do you need? You need either a code of practice um, or ethical guidelines in your newsroom. If you do not have one, then you need to uh, adapt one to suit your uh, your your situation. The, the rules are universal, so it's not much of a tweaking, but it, in essence, it will be good for your editorial staff and you and your governing board, if you have one, 
to determine what are your codes of practice. Take advantage of all opportunities for training. Never believe because you are long in the business that you know it all and therefore a training program is not for you. A workshop is not for you. A session like this is not for you because you know it all. You've been in the business for 30 or 40 years. I can tell you this right off the bat. Our honors presentation today was in large measure a refresher for me. And in some measure, I learned new things. And I've been around in the media as Nazima said since around 1984. So there is always room to learn something new. Uh, one other thing on the question of conflict of interest, I know many of us are small business operators. We are also practicing journalists. Uh, whether you are in a large organization or you're in a very small or micro one, try to have advertising contracts that build in some form of insulation or protection between your content and the advertiser. Not because someone is paying advertising dollars to you, that he or she believes that uh, you are the public relations machine. No, that's not how it works. So I would end here. And if there are any questions or clarifications, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, the Harali on you. <laughs> Somebody, somebody, is, somebody is speaking from an exciting uh, venue. Um, you need to get in a quieter space. <laughs> okay. Hello? Hello, yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. Um, there are news breaking for these news, please, today. Um, just in terms of a, a refresher on the whole issue of being on the record, on background um, information, uh, we, 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 we spoke about checking sources and be careful with uh, using sources. What you often see, for example, someone say, give you 10, 15 minutes of information, you write it down or record it as the case may be, and then they say, well, that's all that is off the record. Um, as I understand it, that usually means you can't use it, period. And some people use that as a way of, of basically protecting themselves. So um, that's clarification in terms of the basic rules for being, for information that is off the record, that is on background, that sort of thing. Off the record means that you cannot use it. On background, you, you can use it without attribution. Um, and uh, um, what you can or some, do sometimes um, is that you can agree with the person or you can go back now to the person after you've got a lot of stuff um, on uh, off the record. What can we agree on that is quotable? Um, so you safeguard yourself as far as uh, you know, not wanting to um, violate any sort of confidentiality. And the person knows that what you agreed on to be quoted will be quoted. Um, but you've got this larger body of knowledge that is off the record that you can now go and test with another source. You understand? Mm -hmm. Question. Um, social media has made um, persons so accessible to us. And so from time to time, you may have a report about an individual and you need a picture. Either the person is um, accused of something, charged of something, or involved in an accident or, or, or some activity, and you go on to the person's page and you take their picture. Can you comment on that, please? And then you use it in your print or in your broadcast. Can you comment on that, please? Okay. After Dennis responds, um, we have Dr. Justin Koo, who is an IP specialist, um, who can also chime in on that. Okay, I look forward to hearing from him as well. Uh, but. Um, what I what I have been doing is that I would I would use the pictures only after as a last resort, and I will say where it was obtained from. Um, in other instances, you may find situations whereby you can agree with the with, with the person, um, or the or the relative, or 
that yes, you know, if you check the Facebook page, there are pictures there you can use. So that's, you know, that's fairly acceptable as well. But you say that there's a picture taken from, from XYZ Facebook profile. But let's hear what uh, the IP specialist has to say because there may be other implications. Yes, Justin, did you, did you hear the question? Okay, he's on, online, but I know he is um, he's at an airport right now, so it could be that he has a connectivity issue. So maybe we can stick up in and come back to that, um, to that question. Can I, can I ask about press releases, specifically those coming from the opposition? And in our case, it happens for both sides. So sometimes you'll get releases that seem literally like rants. Um, a lot of the times I just ignore, and but, but I would want to know, I mean, like, should we in terms of ensuring that we get viewed out or use it or rather not choose to be used as a mouthpiece for an opposition party. Yeah. Dennis, our question is for you. The, the use of press releases, particularly from political parties, how do you manage that? Well, like all other press releases, you, you, depending on what it is, but for the most part, no press release should be used as is. That's largely the rule of the game. You, there must be something in the press release that you would like to question. And if you find a question in the press release, as you should, then you need to call the, 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 uh, the the, the author or the organization that provided the press release. In some instances, I've even gone as far as authenticating the press release because of the nature. And if you if something snaps at you and you feel, uh, well, mm -mm, it may or may not, did you send out this press release, blah, 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 and you read a few lines, yes. But by and large, most if not all press releases ought to have some more legwork on them, seek a reaction from the opposite side, um, question if, well, there should be something you should be able to question, and then you take it from there. It may end up that, it, that using the press release as the basis for calling the person to inquire, you may end up with a brand new, more important story than what the press release actually um, stated in the first instance. Okay, we have a question from Glenn Bart, who's in St. Kitts, and I, I know that the timing is perfect for this question. Could you comment on the ethical dangers or challenges associated with covering politically charged environments, especially around general elections? Oh, no party colors, bottom line. No party colors. Nobody must be able to say you're, you're red, or your yellow or blue or whatever is the oppo opposing color. Keep your opinions and your views yourself. If you're, if you're a, a, a talk show host, then of course you know what you're gonna do there. You're exposing yourself to the vulnerabilities of one side or the other. If you're a journalist and you're practicing journalism, be fair to all sides. At the same time, be wary of of all the controversial topics and the accusations, do not parrot what people are accusing the other side of because it may very well be, 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 be slanderous or libelous. So those are things you've got to look for. Try to work right down the middle and cover everyone as fairly as possible. Cover the issues and by and large, leave out all the dirty slander and, 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 um, and attacks on people's personalities. What are the issues? Are the issues citizenship by investment? Are the, is, are the issues such as, um, as, as governance within the party, governance within the coalition? Are there constitutional issues? Are there issues of, 
of socioeconomic conditions in the country and so on. So do not lend your, leave yourself open to being perceived one by one or the other and do not get into unnecessary or do not get into quarrels period with people who taunt you at political meetings. Just keep a level head and do not get into any argument with anyone. Try to step away from controversy. Anybody tries to target you by saying anything, just back off gently, stay quietly and ease out of the way. If there are marches and picketing demonstrations, do not be in the crowd. You are not one of the demonstrators. You're not one of the marchers. Stay out on the fringes. I know many of these islands in the capitals, the roads are very narrow, but try to stay out of the marches. Do not find yourself be part of the picket or be caught in any pictures or videos. Do not get into rehearsals of picketing demonstrations. By that I mean, the picketers are there, the protesters, and as soon as they see the media, they start to chant just because they saw the media. Or you yourself say, man, y'all chant, man, or y'all hold up y'all clock, or you want a picture, or you want a sound bite. It doesn't work that way. It's either the people are naturally picketing or they're not. You're not there to encourage anybody to pick it because you can fairly report that the, that the demonstrators were at the location with placards, but they were, they, were, they, 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 were, they, they were not chanting or they were not picketing, you know. But for you to go to instigate, that means you're part of the process. That's not your business because you so-called want a good picture or a good shot. Whatever it is, it is. Thanks a lot for that, Dennis. That, that goes um, along with what uh, both of us have said about the, um, the fact that our, our opinion, our belief system, our allegiance, or who we believe is good for the country or who's bad for the country is the last consideration, the very last consideration to be brought to, be, to the picture. Uh, we have a response from um, Dr. Ku uh, on the question of using the social media photographs. Well, he's at the airport right now. He says it's super noisy. You can use a photo if there is a fair dealing exception available. And I asked him to expand on that. If no exception, you must seek the permission of the photographer or the rights holder. This is more often than not, not the person in the photo. And there's a very recent example of this in Trinidad and Tobago where somebody used a social media post and they, they use a photograph of, of a public personality. And uh, that photograph was actually taken by a professional photographer who took rightful exception to use of the photograph in that particular way. So um, Dr. Ku is also saying you must also attribute the photograph to the photographer. That's if there is not a fair dealing exception. Incidentally, this has happened to me numerous times where I am quoted and my photo used. The photo used actually belongs to a third party. And I can assure you the rights were never secured. So that's um, something to be cautious about. Um, some of us um, lift photographs even from other media. Uh, some that's causing some media houses to start uh, to begin watermarking their photos um, to ensure that their rights are protected. Uh, Dennis, how do you manage your ethical balance between what people think of you and what you think is in the best interest of the people? Oh, I don't care about what people think about, uh, about me in that respect. I write my stories today, they like me, tomorrow they hate me. And I believe whatever is the truth and I am comfortable about that, I can stick with it. That's it, too bad for you. Is that being opinionated in one sense? No, it's not. I, I must take a position. Um, it doesn't mean that, as Wesley said, I don't have an opinion or review on something. But do I sit down and mope every day what people think about me if I know that I'm fair, I'm, I'm reporting fairly and accurately? And if I know I'm not taking sides? Even if it causes controversy? Yeah, sorry. I remember, I remember one of my early mentors who is now deceased. Um, uh, Hugh Croskill out of Jamaica. He was in Guyana. He had been in Guyana and had held a workshop at one of the uh, venues here. And he said, we as journalists, we 
we uh, we cover controversy and in many ways we look for it. So if there's a controversy, there's a controversy. I'm not doing anybody's public relations. Would that, would that sometimes result in maybe taking sides? Nope, nope. I give all sides, all shades. What, what, where, whichever side you believe the story comes down on, that's it. That's not for me to decide. I give all sides of the story and that's it. I, th I think that in, in the end, that old um, adage of allowing your conscience to be your guide is what should prevail. So uh, I, we have to bring this session to an end now because um, through my own fault, um, we, we have, we've run over and we don't want to keep um, Kiran waiting um, much longer. But before we come to Kiran, um, we customarily at the MIC would do a group photo. So I won't mind if people turn on their, their, their cameras just for, for a few seconds so that we can take a shot of the cross section. Um, But I'll take I, have, a I have photos from, from Deidre, so I know who is there. Great, <laughs> we've seen, we seen part of the, of the crowd in Belize. Um, we yet to see Norma, Louis, Kevin, Carmelita, April, Jermaine. Well, we know what Jermaine looks like, but we don't mind seeing you again. Daniel. Beyond, come on, 30 seconds. You're, this is keep standing in the way of, of Kiran's lunch. And I understand she has a, a big fat roti and she's just come back to Trinidad after some time. And if you're a Trini and you spend any time abroad, your first meal is customarily a good roti, which I know she has waiting for us. <laughs> Brandon. Um, Roti for lunch, bacon shark for dinner, and I'm going for doubles in the morning. And I'm waiting so, for my bacon shark. <laughs> that, that four and a half months away um, deprived me. <laughs> okay, okay, okay I'll, I'll take a shot of this because I don't know who, um, who else. Because um, and let me go, right. So let me just quickly um, introduce Kiran. Um, you know, Kiran Maharaj, she, she's president and co-founder of the Media Institute of the Caribbean. Some of you know the Media Institute very well. A training institution doing great work. It's headquartered in Jamaica. Kiran also heads the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network. And you, if you have not already done so, you should go to the website because there's a series of investigations right now on the question of citizens by invitation Citizens by investment programs in the region. It does include Belize, so look out for the Belize installment. Um, CIJN is the region's first and only nonprofit investigative media news website. She's immediate past president of the Trinidad and Tobago Publishers and Broadcasters Association and currently serves as vice president of the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce because. Um, Kiran comes into this question of journalism, both as a working journalist, but as a media entrepreneur, a leading media entrepreneur in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. Because she's also managing director of Caribbean Lifestyle Communications in Trinidad and Tobago. And in that capacity, she founded Heartbeat Radio 104.1 FM, the world's first radio station for women. I'm sure it's available. Um, all of her frequencies mm -hmm. are are online and so you can get them either through Radio Garden or through the um, the websites themselves. So I'm going to turn you over to Kiran and Kiran is going to take us through a session that deals with the health of the Caribbean media and what the future is likely to hold. So Kiran, over to you. Okay, just want to make sure everybody could see my screen. Wesley? Yes, seeing your screen. Okay, I'm going to go to full view. Give me one second to switch over. Okay. Perfect. All right. So um, thank you all for staying on. I'm going to try to be as quick as I can because I'm sure I'm getting in the way of everybody else's lunch as well. So just to put things into perspective, because I think we all have our fears of what is happening um, right now with media and where we are going to be. 
So let's look at the current challenges. We have the economic challenges, which existed before, and they have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And in fact, Media Institute of the Caribbean did a survey in September of 2020. And what we noted was that with the journalists surveyed from the 16 countries across the region, um, many of them said they had to look for other jobs. Some of them noted that their time in the newsrooms um, was, was cut. Um, and so we know that the newsrooms have been severely affected by the pandemic. Of course, we have big tech tort here. That is what I call it. What we are seeing um, more and more, and it's becoming more prevalent in our region anyway, is that um, these big tech companies use our content um, and we do not get as much revenue as we should. Whereas in places like Australia, they have that um, new law where the media houses and the independent media houses um, can bargain with the entities like Google and Facebook and, and others um, to get a fair share of revenue. We're seeing moves being made as well in Canada and um, definitely that is being transferred now into the UK and um, European countries. So we have to get to that point in our region. We know about the infodemic and fake news. I don't think I need to tell you all that. Technology is great, but technology has done some disservice when it comes to misinformation and disinformation. Risk of media capture. For those of you who don't know what media capture is, it is really where um, other individuals who do not own the media or organizations have a lot of influence over them. And that affects the editorial content and output. So that could be political parties, it could be conglomerates, it could be select advertisers, all of that filters into what is deemed to be media capture. All of this risks our editorial independence. And if we are smaller media outlets, we are aware of that in our region with small economies, as much as 50 to 60% of revenue comes from state advertising for some. And that is a very high figure. So it means our editorial independence is already at risk in those situations. There is a lack of legislation for an enabling environment for information in the public interest. And when we talk about lack of legislation, we're talking about freedom of information and access to information laws. We're talking about whistleblower protection. We're talking about data protection, cybercrime, interception of communication, um, procurement um, policies and the Procurement Act. All of that affects how well we can report in the public interest. There are legislative threats to investigative journalism. I just called out a list of legislative um, uh, of legislation, but there are other legislative threats. These could be in the form of criminal defamation. Um, I don't know if Belize has criminal defamation, if anybody could tell me and put it in the chat. But the thing is, um, when there are defamation laws, it means that the journalists can get into hot water because those uh, issues can be stuck in court for a very long time. The media houses have the same kinds of liability. And this has actually been used in certain countries to put pressure intentionally on media houses and journalists because it affects their pockets. So we saw a lot of that. I'll, I'll come to closer to home. Um, Venezuela was very known for that. And where they had big independent news outlets, one of them in particular had to actually shut down. So journalists are under attack. We know that this year's World Press Freedom theme was um, journalism and the digital siege. I think that in our region, that is something that we have to be on the lookout for because we don't know. And so truth is also being exchanged for opinion. In the midst of all of this, there are blurred lines of what is news. Um, we have the issue of citizen journalists. While I think that there are some merits, I also think that there are a lot of um, pitfalls with that. So anybody want to get out of journalism now? You can show of hands, because these are all the issues we're facing today. So I have been asked to look at what happens tomorrow, the future. Where do we go from here? Um, there is the issue of media viability. 
um, Media Institute of the Caribbean just completed a study, which was actually the global study for UNESCO using their media viability indicators, which are six indicators, six groups or themes, and they look at what is affecting media viability. And then we came up with recommendations. So that is at the MIC website. And you can look at the recommendations and the findings. What's, what um, definitely stuck out to me was that although we did it in Jamaica, it was applicable for all of us in our region, Belize included. And so I think it's a very important report to be able to understand how we navigate the current media landscape. Economic support is very, very important because we are seeing the, is not just the economic pressure, but the rising costs. So advertising is decreasing. Our operational costs are increasing. It is also putting um, a lot more pressure too on the newsrooms, because to me, a journalist should not be covering five or six beats. If you could get journalists who specialize in maybe three areas minimum, I think that is the way we need to go, especially if you're in the newspaper and digital business, right? But all of that is now under pressure. So what is happening to our content? To me, our content is being diluted in a way too. And that's why we're affected by, by what is happening economically. So in some countries, um, there, have been, uh, there have been initiatives to try to change that and to, and to try to support journalists. MIC is actually going to be meeting with the stakeholders in Jamaica later this week, where we are going to try to come up with an action plan. And if we are able to do that successfully, then it can act as a blueprint as to what we could do in the region with stakeholders and the stakeholders being not just um, government, but private sector, civil society, media, and some other support groups. Digital and traditional will become more symbiotic. If you are not, if you are coming from traditional and you are not using digital um, to not just drive the interest and awareness to what you're doing, but also to get feedback, then you're way, way behind. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy mindset where we have to go from the traditional mindset into the digital. I know I am dealing with it myself, but we have to look at what is digital doing successfully and what can we take away and adapt for what we wanted to do? And I think that that's the point that a lot of us don't factor into our business models. And we have to start doing it because there are more advertising dollars there. But there is also the opportunity for better leads for our news also. And we need to be able to look at that. So they will become more symbiotic because it's the only way to go. Legislative support. I mentioned Australia, Canada, and the U.S., and in fact, um, the U.N. Special Report here, there was a, a report released this morning about viability, um, and the Special Report here is Irene Khan. If you all Google U.N. Special Report, your report and put her name after it, it should come up, um, and she talks about viability and the importance of supporting journalism, and she has made some recommendations of her own. So all of this talk, you know, all of this chatter says that, look, there is a clamor for supporting our journalists and supporting our media, maintaining an independent media. And this is something that we have to start making moves towards in our region. Data will start to become important to help us all improve our bottom lines, because the one win that digital has over traditional is that they have data. Albeit right now, a lot of that data, you know, there, there's lots of talk about the algorithms being artificially generated. And yes, there is some evidence of that. But at the end of the day, by and large, how they use data helps them to get the revenues. And this is one of the reasons why I say we have to become more symbiotic and embrace it. Media literacy is very important. Me Somebody said to me, media literacy is telling parents to put this, this safety pin, you know, on their TV. I said, no, that is not what media literacy is. Media literacy is getting people used to the fact that, listen, when you get a message on your WhatsApp, don't start sending it all over because it might be fake. Check it first. Media literacy is about what are the sources of news and information that are the most reliable 
in the place you live, in the country you live in. That is also media literacy. Don't believe everything on the internet. That is media literacy, right? All of that deals with media literacy and we really have to start doing more of it on the ground and in classrooms. Increased stakeholder collaboration is important. What we've noticed um, in doing the, the viability study and, and a lot of research is in those societies where they have civil society actors, which include entities like Transparency International, um, where they have stakeholder collaboration with the media, they have more, a better chance of producing viability support for journalists and the media. So there has to be increased stakeholder collaboration. And I think we will see it coming. So how do we get there? What can we do? Because we, we know what the picture is. We seem to understand, okay, this is where we may be headed. So how do we get there? What's the roadmap? Definitely, we have to strengthen relations among media associations locally and regionally. So what we're doing here today is actually a great effort and it is a pathway for us to build that bridge. So ACM and others, your own local media associations, we have to also gain support from our global network. So entities like ACM and MIC, we belong to larger organizations. If you have your own local media association, there are some that you should join too. And the reason why is because for me, it's the benefit of the exchange of information and ideas more than anything else. And they also can support you with advocacy. So definitely get involved, not just with the, the local and regional, but look at what support you could get from your global networks. There has to be stakeholder discussions and MOUs in country. And I just alluded to that with what we're going to be doing with Jamaica or attempting to do. Let's hope it, it goes well. But you have to start looking at who are those stakeholders that understand the importance of media and view it as, um, to borrow to and from the Press Association of Jamaica, the oxygen of our democracy. Um, and once we know that, and once we know that these transparency institutes or these other NGOs, we need to start talking to them about how they view what is happening with the media and how they could support an independent media. Advocacy is very, very, very important. I, I will say this every day of my life until I really feel it changes, which is we are great at reporting on issues and people, but we do a terrible job at reporting on ourselves as the media. I do not know why, but we need to change it. We have to start with advocating for our industry and getting people to understand what is happening, whether that is from the legislative aspects or press freedom aspects or any other aspects, we need to do more advocacy. Leadership is very important. And I, and I think Wesley talked about that um, very early. He made a comment about leadership. There has to be a champion or several champions. This is not something that could be accomplished without somebody or some entity or group of people who is going to be clamoring and working hard at it day in and day out. Leadership is significant, right? If there's nobody to lead the cause, nothing here we are talking about is going to get anywhere. We have to increase cross-border collaboration and I'll explain why. With CIJN, which is the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network, and I had put a link to the website in the chat. There are stories that you might have that you can't put your byline on or um, talk about because of the situation it will cause, victimization, harassment, anything else. And so if you were to work within a regional framework of journalists, you could give that story to a colleague um, in another country and even suggest that a team be pulled together and you all could do that story and you have the protection. This was the success of ICIJ and Panama Papers. It has been the success of OOCRP. It has been the success of Reuters and Associated Press. And I think it is time that we need to look at how we integrate our efforts and really work towards increasing our cross-border collaboration. 
And that is why CIJN was formed, because after we had done this amount of investigative training in our first fellowship and journalists went back out to their newsrooms and we thought they would be able to tackle their own stories, it was difficult for them. And we realized we really had to do this as a team effort. And if they don't want to put their byline on it because they need a level of protection, then they can do that. They can stay anonymous. It gives them that protection. So please look at how you all could increase your cross-border collaboration and be present at forums that allow the issues to be aired. At the start of the session today, you know, we said that we may um, stop the recording if there were any sensitive issues, because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We all understand the dangers and we have to be able to talk about them. And doing that in a safe space like we are doing right now is very important for us trying to find the solutions to the problems we're facing. So I just wanted to, to make mention that you all need to have your safe spaces to discuss the issues, but also go to forums where you could learn and interact and share your experiences with others, because that is also going to help you to get support. So that basically is the roadmap for how we get there. Um, I'll just close by giving you the information to get in touch with us. I talked about cross-border collaboration, but MIC has also been doing um, grants for stories, and you can send story ideas to micstoryideas at gmail.com, and um, we're always willing to look at them and see what is possible. We have specific calls out for um, certain stories that you can get involved in. We have a series coming up right now on climate justice. Wesley mentioned we're doing citizenship by investment. Belize's story actually is not citizenship by investment, but it's going to be on um, real estate and what's happening with um, some of the mysterious real estate um, in Belize and other countries in the Caribbean. So um, you can send ideas there. There's the admin email for Media Institute, our phone numbers, and then my personal email, which I always share. Um, I usually get back to anybody who sends me an email within 24 hours and um and i can try to see how best i can help so that is it for my presentation i went really quickly um i don't know if there are questions wesley well there haven't been any questions in the chat but i'm sure people have questions they'd want to post to you now and thanks a lot for the the time economy you're much better at it than i am Yes, I knew um, I might have to make up for your shortcoming, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so did you anything from, from your folks on that side? Anything from the colleagues and said kids? Because all of this is related. Eh? Um, the ACM was founded on three fundamental pillars. Um, the first one, an overriding one, an overarching one, is press freedom. And a lot of what Kiran has spoken about regarding media viability and the state of health of the regional media right now are, are parts of the prerequisites for having strong um, media and for achieving a high level of press freedom. The, what other, other pillar has to do with networking in terms of us working together? And the MIC has done that at several levels including the fact that it offers a very solid space for joint collaborations on stories. And there's nothing better to bring journalists together than joint journalistic projects where we can see firsthand the assets that, that we all bring from our various backgrounds. And the other one has to do with professional development and training, which is the core responsibility of the Media Institute of the Caribbean. In the last two years, this is the pandemic era, I've lost count on the number of workshops and, and, and um, training sessions we have had on a wide variety of issues, on core journalistic issues, but also on subject specific issues in terms of covering things better, including the pandemic itself and COVID-19. So any questions at all, feel free to, uh, to pose them now. We will run again for the next um, five or six minutes. And um, then we will um, we will await suggestions for for follow ups, um, which will be tailored differently. It wouldn't be this is an initial encounter. What you've heard today is really just skirting 
a dozen different issues that we can always get into um, further. And, the, and I do want to close this with one last thing. And Nazima is president of the ACM. And she would tell you that the ACM is an association of associations. Uh, right now, we have 10 national associations, some of them in different at different levels of sophistication and, and, and strength. But it's very important for you as a, as a media um, landscape the, the folks in St. Kitts and Nevis have recently revised their, revitalized theirs. And, and um, the person at the helm is Andre Hui, and he's on the call now. He can tell you about that experience. Deidre can probably take his details and, and swap experiences. What are the challenges you face? But I think that it's very important for all of the above reasons that the journalists in Belize get together. You can agree to disagree. It doesn't mean that you stop competing <laughs> as journalists, that you stop scooping each other um, and even calling each other out when there's malpractice. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's very important for you to be, to, to get organized. So any questions yeah. for Kiran, further questions for Kiran or comments? And you know, I just wanted to make the point that, that the, my presentation was really for you all to understand what your challenges are that you're going to have coming up and where your mind should be. Um, you know, as an association, because those are the things you're going to have to deal with. And we've seen this happening with associations everywhere. And it, it takes a degree of planning for you to be effective. It takes a degree of you being very focused on what it is you want to accomplish to be able to get there. But if you were to ask me, is the media under attack? And are we, are we really at threat? I would say yes. My feeling is we are right now. Um, and the biggest threat to me are the legislative threats because we are not lawyers and we don't sit in parliament all day. And what I have come to realize is that most countries, they try to slip things in through parliament and through legislation. And it is only afterwards we realize, hold on, this is going to impact our press freedom. How come we didn't see this coming? You know, um, and that is one of the things you really need to be mindful about and to understand you're going to have to really be united in your approach and you have to pay attention to what, what they're doing. And Wesley and Kiran, at this point, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, and, and for the benefit of our Belizean journalists who are gathered here, I found an attorney who's um, volunteering her time to draft a skeleton of what would take to form a live a media association legally. What I want to ask our journalists here and ask you guys here is for those who participated today to agree to be a nucleus to review that, that legal structure, yay, nay, change, amend, and to also agree to be the nucleus of membership and the nucleus for leadership, but also to ask for your technical guidance to help us to facilitate that session when we're reviewing that legal draft so that they can take owner of it, ownership of it, we can identify leadership for it, and we can see how, how they, um, they provide a leadership for something that will represent them. And ideally, to start the way ACM, with the focus of ACM, which is to develop skills, to develop a camaraderie and a tighter knit between themselves and to um, be a, a central point that can communicate with agencies like yourself to bring additional um, aid and opportunities like we did today to the wider group of journalists in the US. So I'm putting you on the spot to, with a second request of, of facilitator for that section and then putting our local journalists on the spot to, to want to come together to review such a documentation and provide leadership to take that association forward for you. Yeah, of course. Well, it, it, it won't be putting us on the spot. In fact, the ACM, that's what the ACM is here for. That's what MIC is here for. And if you wish, I can um, provide you with some of the... In every country, you'll find that the configuration is different because the media landscape is different. The history, historical development of, 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 of um, the media and media representation is different. So if you want, we can provide you three of the longstanding organizations the Press Association of Jamaica has a very well-developed constitution. You can look at, you may or may not want to, because they, they, you have to look at the categories of membership. And the Press Association of Jamaica has, has, a, has a categorization that's gonna be a little different from the categorization 
that the Guyana Press Association, and we can get that one for you. The Media Association of Trinidad and Tobago has gone undergone several mutations. So it's good to understand what has happened with them as well, so that it will feed into, you will never get a perfect document, never. The situation is changing, circumstances are changing and you'll find that the, your constitution will be a, a work in progress perpetually. And that you need to keep an eye on it, not obsessed with it because at the end of the day, what would make difference a difference is are the actions that you take the interventions that you make on behalf of the journalists and the extent to which you are able to get journalists involved in the process. Bearing in mind, and I always put this out, not all journalists like a set of meetings. Eh? So, but there are journalists who will not attend a single meeting, but if you organize an event and you want somebody who to, who to, to arrange the event and, and bring some management skills to all the different people, they are going to be right there with you and all your meetings, people will, will not be at. So just recognize what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses and move forward with that. And I'm sure that you will, um, you'll find um, a, a, an organizer, you will come up with something that is suitable for the, the journalists of Belize. Wesley, yeah. um, I have forgotten, but back in 22, you did give me all three of those um, documentations that you mentioned. Oh, I forgot. Um, Yes, and in talking with the attorney, what I asked her to do is to start at the broadest level of inclusion so that then the journalists who are the seed members can then determine that, that focus of inclusion that we want at the end of the day. So to start broad and then they have the latitude to whittle it down to what kind of inclusion they want or what kind of structure they want. Um, and then with a facilitator like yourself that is so familiar with the others, you could prompt as we as we review these documentations for considerations that are not there that would be worthy for us to have. Sure, makes sense. Um, my question would be in terms of uh, media association versus a trade union, and obviously a trade union would carry. Uh, far greater significance in terms of being able to negotiate with uh, employers and with government for uh, conditions um, that, that, that suit uh, media houses. For instance, uh, on the issue of salary, on the issue of occupational safety and health, that sort of thing. Would there be advantages, I'm asking then, in terms of making it a trade union over making it a, a, an association? You know, over the years, I've advised against uh, attempting to follow that route. I, incidentally, am a very strong supporter of, of the labor, labor movement, trade unions. In fact, my last newspaper column made that point very, very clear. I think that in the media sector, we need to have more unions and stronger unions and unions that are more attuned to the special needs of media. But that's separate and distinct from a professional organization that I, I, the same way that you would have your bar association, your law association, you would have your professional associations of, of doctors and, and, and dentists and engineers and so on. In the same way, you need to have an, an organization that promotes the professional interests of journalists, best practices and so on. Industrial relations, collective bargaining, those require, those things require very specialized skills that are not always in, in, in tandem, right in tandem with the, the agendas of, of media workers. So yes, um, I think that, it, that is, is a case for more unions, more union representation, stronger unions, and even more importantly, enlightened trade unions that understand the, the nature of the job. You have trade unions out there that are representing your accounting staff and your media staff and your newsroom staff and using the same kind of industrial relations templates, we have to move away from that. But I won't say that, that um, an association of professional journalists um, needs to go down that line because I have deep respect for both branches. They require different skills, different specializations. So you, so you could have, I, I guess my question would be, so you could have both or one or the other, but we don't have either at this point. So obviously we need right. something. I, I think I think the, the unionism can come out once we have 
right. formalized ourselves and, mm -hmm. and gotten ourselves more recognized. Right now, we're a loose bunch. We're more mm -hmm. individuals working for individual media houses. And I think if we can come together in an association and, and have our jobs in a row from an association point, point of view, as Wesley mentioned, those other things would, would, make, would facilitate the, the, the arrival of those other things as well. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. We need to yeah. have now, so it looks as if we're having the, the meeting that um, you're proposing to have because uh, these are fundamental issues that need a lot of ventilation and, and discourse and fine tuning. So let's just take two more contributions before we, um, we, we close. So Kevin, Daniel. with his hand up and then yeah. Daniel. Hi, Kevin. good afternoon. Hi, yeah. I'm Kevin Mendes from Belize. I work as a TV host for Channel 7. Um, so I'm pretty new in the in the media um, era in the media in the media space. So I want to say thank you for um, this session. It was quite insightful and useful as it comes to the what comes with the with the privilege I can say of, of being in this space of being in the media. So like it it draws like it puts me down on, on the responsibility and how to go about doing that. Um, as somebody new, I uh, and being part of this network, which clearly has like. A lot of like skills and experience to share. It would be good if we can have uh, more sessions on like on communication building. So like how to go about like asking questions for us to be able to get um, information that's useful, that's that's thought provoking, that um, uh, is, is factual as well. And also when it comes to like um, aesthetics of the media, so to like us as hosts or reporters that has to do with how do you look? You know your appearance. How do you dress? your makeup, your background, your posture, all of those things I feel uh, adds to the credibility, adds to the, to, to, you know, to the impact on your viewers and, and those kind of things. So those two things is something that I would love to, to learn more um, being in this space. So I feel like I can probably get that here. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kevin. Daniel? Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, Daniel Ortiz from Channel 7. Um, Kevin is my colleague. Um, I, I see the points you guys have made about the strength in numbers, but we've had an issue in Belize where um, other more senior media people have tried to organize journalists among themselves to speak with one voice and is the perennial problem is that while they rank and file, the field journalists, the field cameramen are always willing to do something like that. We have an issue where the competing interests of our management, um, they, they don't seem to play very well, very nicely amongst themselves. And uh, those that, that's, that's been one of the biggest challenges to a lasting um media association uh from my observation so how does how do we the people who believe in something like that um to form protections for ourselves where we can try to get professional development and a benchmark for what remuneration what proper remuneration should be how do we go about that knowing that our upper management uh levels will uh act as impediments. Um, You're on I today, guess can I I can Andre, okay. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. I actually was going to, so, just, so that question kind of came in quite timely. Here in St. Kitts and Nevis, our media association was dormant for about 15 years. And about two years ago, a group of us came together and decided we would like to have the association um, revived. And one of the first things we did when we, we set up an interim committee of some of the persons who have expressed interest. And we, one of the first things we did is that we actually met with the media owners of the various media houses. Most of them, not all, we didn't get to all, but we did meet with most of them. And we engaged them as to, one, do they see a value in having a media association? What are some of the concerns and needs they have? So we kind of got from the management standpoint what were the issues they were going through and how they think or how they thought a media association would assist to address those challenges. I think, I, and I don't know the, the situation in Belize and of course every situation is different. So what may work in St. Kitts may not work 
in the lease. But my suggestion is, if it's possible, if you could have an interim committee of interested journalists and media workers, set up these meetings with these management, the, the management, the management persons of the various media houses, and engage them. If they can see value in having an association, in other words, how it benefits them, what's in it for me as a media owner, as a media manager, then they might be more inclined to lend support to an association or have their members, have their workers become a part of an association that they may get benefits from. So that was one way. And we, we won the buy-in from the media owners um, because in the past, they've also had bad experiences with the, with the previous association. And so we wanted to engage them and to ensure that we were on the same you know, playing field or the, you know, we were seeing eye to eye when it came to issues of, when it come to issues of um, media and, and how they themselves could get. So that worked for us. And so maybe that's a, a, an approach that could be taken in Belize. Yeah, yeah, I was going to suggest something similar. And that's why I said, you know, planning is very important. Once you get everybody to understand what the purpose of the organization is, and the media managers don't see this as a, as a trade union issue, let me just be blunt, right? Um, I think they will understand because that is what the association is first and foremost. You're about ensuring that journalists have the ability to operate in a safe space. You're about press freedom issues. You're about the legislative things that affect your work, right? And they will understand, but I, I would think that they would as a media manager that, listen, these are things that affect my business model. These are things that I would need to support. And I think once you get them to understand that, you know, then, then you could move forward. I think Nadira has also said something quite interesting when she appeared with us uh, on one of our media houses in that in the Guyana situation, the owners, managers are members, but don't have voting rights. And so um, the people with the voting rights are actually the media workers. And so their, their membership then, it seems to suggest that their membership then is at a different level and for a different purpose and not necessarily for that. So both the experience of seeing kids and, and that um, uh, mentioned from the zero could also let us know that um, of how we, how we envision ourselves and, and the role that the association envisions itself playing. Because Daniel was right, the ownership, um, even from when I was um, in, in the association, when, it, when, when I first started, was very divisive. And it was because they were politically aligned as well. And so that introduced a lot of problems. Um, uh, and so it was hard to, 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 for them to come together because they were competing political interests, not just competing business interests. Um, and so that's something that we have to manage with ourselves as well. No, no, a lot of said it, it all depends on the terrain. Different organizations have different criteria for membership. Um, and I think that it makes sense. GPA, get, take advice from GPA, Nazima, and they in Guyana, Press Association of Jamaica. These are organizations that have been around for decades. They have had peaks and troughs like everybody else. But what has kept them viable? Is the, is the fact that they've been able to manipulate the needs uh, very clearly. Jumin, you just have 30 seconds because we really have to go now. Uh, some of us have other assignments to attend to. Uh, so Jumin, very quickly. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just, I just wanted to support what everyone was saying, but in terms of the approach of Belly's, you know, you're starting an association. It should be an association and not a trade union that that is a perspective that they should take it from because most media managers would be concerned if you're telling me you're, you're establishing a trade union rather than an association because i'm going to see that as a direct threat to how i'm my approach to managing my organization would be and just quickly to add that um it's not something that's going to be taken that would not okay it's not something that would be you establish a committee today to start functioning tomorrow. It's something that's going to be done over one or two year period before you get to the perspective that you really want to get to. Because for us, it took us two years of back and forth. Um, actually, it took us two years to actually finish drafting our constitution here in St. Kitts before we actually get to the perspective of an association. And we're still building. So it's something that is not a short-term fix, but a, a long-term perspective that should be uh, the focus for Belize as an association. And that's just my perspective, not as a trade union, but an association. Very good advice, Jim. And I, I, I agree with you completely. 
Um, well, so we have to we have to sign off now because I said some of us have other assignments. Nazima, do you have any parting words for us? Nazima is president of the. Oh, no. Thank you. I'm going to be competing with my son a little here. I just wanted to say, just don't aim for perfection right off the bat. It's going to take some work, and these are good issues to start discussions on. Um, these are good mommy, issues to have perspective mommy. on, and you know it. I, I must commend uh, Deidre for pulling together this uh, training and, you know, uh, working on, on her end to get the journalists here and at ACM, uh, you know, Wesley for putting together this training and our presenters for being here today. Yes, Rain, one minute. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm really hoping that you participate in our, our other training uh, that come come up from time to time through ACM and also oh, the Media yeah. Institute. So, and it was really good. This was a really uh, engaging uh, session and I really had a, a really good time this morning. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you all as well. Bye-bye. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, we'll forward a little bit and I'll ask you guys if some would come in the front and then some stay behind the tables.